Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> welcome to meeting number 29 of the Parks and Environment Committee. And welcome to members of the committee. Uh, no one from outside is here yet. Um, and to the members of the public, wow, this is quite the crowd. Thanks for coming. You're going to like this committee, the friendliest, most powerful committee at City Hall. And this is our last meeting of this term, for the, some of you, for me forever, uh, as chair. Um, so um, I will do thank yous later on, on that. But for those in the room with us, the screen at the back of the room provides real-time updates concerning where we are in the agenda and what's coming up next, if you want to take a look. You can also follow the agenda on your computer, or tablet, or smartphone at www.toronto.ca slash council. <clears throat> the Parks and Environment Committee gratefully acknowledges it is meeting on the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the new Credit Na First Nation, the Haudenosaunee, the Huron-Wendat, and home to many diverse Indigenous peoples. Thank you. And we will go through the, um, the order paper. <clears throat> First, is there any, are there any declarations of interest under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act? Seeing none, um, are there, can I have someone confirm the minutes of the May meeting? Council Doucet, Vice, Vice Chair Doucet. All in favor, oppose, that carries. <clears throat> and um, we will go through the agenda and I will um, inform you how to give a deputation if it's your first time. So, um, PE 29.1, donation of new tennis courts at Lytton Park. There we have deputations on that, so we'll hold for those. <clears throat> PE 29.2, a draft biodiversity strategy for Toronto. We're holding for presentation and deputations. Um, PE 29.3, sustainable energy plan financing program enhancement. Do we have anything on that? Does anyone want to move that? Or? Perhaps if we held it down, that might be a good opportunity for us to discuss uh, recent Absolutely. Changes. That's a good idea. Is that all right? Just, I was going to do that. Sticking around? Great. Thank you. I was just going to do that as a presentation, but we can, also, we can do it here. So we'll hold to discuss um, some horrific changes that we just heard about from the provincial government yesterday. PE 29.4, Annual Corporate Energy Consumption and Greenhouse Gas Emissions, 2017. Move received. Move received. Uh, all in favor? Opposed, that carries. Thank you. PE 29.5, Retrofitting an Existing City-Owned Building uh, at Clydesdale Park. Would anyone like to move that? That is Ward 33. Uh, it's out. That's your first time moving that. Thank you very much. All in favor? Unanimous? <laughs> Thank you. PE 29.6, wireless connectivity on Toronto Island Park. I think we, are, we have deputations on that, so we'll hold for that. And we have new business to add. Let's just see here. Um, Councillor, I don't think it's in any particular order for me, but... Um, Councillor Doucette, Doucette, right? So Councillor Doucette has two items to add. Um, and so one is about the Ravina Clubhouse. So can I have a motion to add that to the agenda? All in favor? Opposed, that carries. And um, the other one is about the High Park Woodland and Savannah Management Plan. Okay, Councillor Doucette's moving that. All in favor? Opposed, that carries. Let's see your arms, folks. Um, and then we have two items by Councillor Robinson. And just one. Oh, it's one. I have Sorry. duplicates. Um, so the Sherwood Park Environmentally Significant Area. Could I have a motion to add that to the agenda, Vice Chair Doucette? All in favor? Opposed? That carries. I know. <clears throat> Gentlemen, you haven't voted on many things, so let's just be mindful. Okay, right. So, do we want do we want to do we want to move these seven, eight, and nine? Okay. 
Um, so Councillor Matlow and Layton, we're, we're adding things to the agenda and we're moving them if you'd like to hear about them. Thank you. Uh, pardon me. Because Councillor Doucette is very excited. We're racket making racket uh, racket sport puns over here. All right. Um, you always I was telling agenda. him to behave. I, I... So Councillor Doucette's um, item, which is seven, I think it is. Yes. We don't have it marked yet. Uh, Ravina. The Ravina Clubhouse. Um, would you like to move that? Uh, okay. All in favor, opposed, that carries. And then um, the review of number eight, review of the High Park Woodland and Savannah Management Plan. Count, uh, Vice Chair Doucette would like to move that. All in favor, opposed, that carries. And then we have one from Councillor Robinson, which is item number nine, Sherwood Park Environmentally Significant Area. Um, Vice Chair Doucette's moving that. Do you want to? It's, it's prioritizing the repair of a fence, correct? In, a, in an environmentally significant area. I think there's a problem with off-leash dogs, et cetera. Okay. I'll, I'll. <laughs> Do it at council. All right, all in favor? Opposed, that carries. All right, now we're going to get to the deputations. Um, so the, we're, we're going to go back to the beginning, PE 29.1, donation of new tennis courts at Lytton Park. So we have a few deputations on that. Um, welcome, Councillor Kristen Wong-Tam. Welcome. All right. So first off, we have uh, Bruce Cavan from the North Toronto Tennis Club. If you'd like to come up. So for deputations, for anyone who hasn't been here, we ask that you come up to the hot seat right here at the table. And welcome. Have you deputed before or no? Have you given a deputation before? Here? OK. So for everyone and for Bruce, you have five minutes to depute. And you have a clock there and a clock behind. If you have eyes in the back of your head, you could see that. And so we'll time you and then you can speak and then we can ask you questions. Unfortunately, you can't ask us questions. You could offline. Um, so we can ask you questions if we have any. And um, then after the deputations, we will ask questions of staff if we have any, and then we will discuss it and then we will make recommendations and, and it will go to council. All right. All right. So without further ado, I will uh, ask you to start. And there's a light on your microphone for you to, at the bottom, a little button to press to see if it's on. All right, go ahead, thank you. Is it, uh, can you hear me? Okay, thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Bruce Cavan, and I am the president and chair of the North Toronto Tennis Club. I'm here today with my colleagues, Mark Crone and Saul Cosimer. Mark is our general manager and has been with the club in this role since 2014. And Saul is a longtime member of our club and is on the board. We're here today to discuss the agenda item, donation of new tennis courts at Lytton Park, Ward 16. Parks and Recreation has filed their report in this matter, and our club has previously filed an application for this project. There is a summary document available today as well, and I believe it's an email. I have copies of it uh, for anyone else who wants to have a look at it. Essentially, our club has reached capacity, and we wish to expand our facilities by adding two clay courts on the grass bowling green directly south of our clubhouse. This green is one of the two that are currently permitted to the North Toronto Lawn Bowling and Croquet Club. The North Toronto Tennis Club has approximately 450 members and has been in full capacity since 2015. Our club has been in existence for over 85 years and has a long-standing relationship with the local community. Unfortunately, because of our limited capacity, year after year, we turn away many prospective members and we're not able to host as many community events as we would like. In fact, since May 2015, when our members have reached its capacity, we turned away over 600 people looking to participate in our club programs. Our junior programs have grown yearly since 2015 and we have plans to enhance these programs even further. Our junior spring and fall after group school lessons and summer tennis camps are extremely popular and highly related in this community. Our junior programs are open to any juniors in the area, in fact, in the city. The addition of the two courts will enable our club to accept many more potential members and expand our programming, including increased coaching and playing times for local public high schools, 
as well as to provide programs for underprivileged and development challenged youths from the community at large. Consistent with the city guideline of 125 members per court, by adding two no courts, our objective is to add approximately 250 members, bring our total membership to approximately 700 adults and juniors combined. Our vibrant membership is currently made up of adults, juniors, families, and seniors alike. These new courts will benefit both new and current members and the community at large, as will provide more space to accommodate our programs and less waiting time for courts. The expansion of our facility will allow us to expand and enhance our volunteer component opportunities, special events, and recognition, recognition opportunities for local businesses. The addition of the clay courts will also be an environmentally friendly enhancement to the city-owned facility. This expansion aligns with the facility provision strategy for tennis courts outlined in the 2017 Parks, Forestry and Recreation Facilities Master Plan and the principles of tennis excellence strategy. Our membership totally supports this expansion project and fundraising activities will commence immediately upon approval. North Toronto Tennis has already investigated several funding options which will be utilized once our campaign is launched. In the past, we've worked with a city-approved contractor who's ready to work with us once our contract is in place with the city. We have met with both Parks and Recreation Department and the members of the Croquet Club. We've offered to help co-manage the Croquet Club while their members are not present, as unfortunately, in the past, there have been issues of vandalism while they are not on site. Uh, we run our tennis club from about 8.30 to 10 every day. We're there seven days a week in the season. It's pretty well all my comments. I thank you for your time and attention. Happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much. You came in under time. Succinct. Anyone have questions of Bruce? Seeing none. Um, so I actually had one. Um, so you're saying you, you, were, you have worked with the... Um, Lawn Bowling Croquet Club in the past. Well, I haven't. We've we've we met we met with them in last fall. The Parks and Rec and ourselves and the Croquet Club. We all met together last last December. And was your councillor in on those meetings? I'm sorry. Was your was your local councillor in on those meetings as well? Yes, she was. Okay. She's fully aware of what we're doing and the, the whole scenario. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Right. And next up, we have Jim Wright from the North Toronto Croquet Club. Hi, Jim. Welcome. Hi. Think, just checking if the light's on on your button on. Yes, it's on. Great, thanks. 750 members projected. 750 in an area that is a small park with one single road and zero parking. 750 projected. Thank you for the opportunity to speak at this meeting. Uh, as mentioned, I'm Jim Wright and I'm the president of the North Toronto Lawn Bowling and Croquet Club. The purpose of the meeting today, as I understand it, is to approve a donation to Parks, Forestry and Recreation of a gift to the city for new tennis courts at Lytton Park. Well, who wouldn't want a donation of $300,000? This sounds like a good thing, a good news story. No political fallout from that, a feather in the cap of the Development Office of Parks, Forestry and Recreation. But how is it that the chief beneficiaries of the donation are the very people who are giving the money? Is that a donation or a purchase? Accepting the so-called gift to build tennis courts is the beginning of a process that has serious and permanent implications for the North Toronto Lawn Bowling and Croquet Club, a legitimate, a legitimate permit holder in good standing that has been a part of the community of Lytton Park for over 105 years. Why would city councillors wish to harm a struggling club taking half its lawns to build additional tennis courts when there are over 600 tennis courts and 200 tennis clubs already available for tennis players? There are two croquet clubs. The North Toronto Lawn Bowling and Croquet Club has been in existence for over a century, but in recent years has been under siege. A previous administration increased our permit fee by thousands of dollars and our grant of $4,000 to maintain the property was eliminated. Suddenly our budget went from a manageable amount to something that has been close to bankrupting us. The necessary increase in membership dues has made it very difficult to recruit new members. And now this, a report that we just received yesterday 
that was promised back in January? Where is fair process? What is the rush to irrevocably change a green park into a paved cement pad? As singer Joni Mitchell says in her famous song, they paved paradise and put up a parking lot. In the report, it refers to mitigation of the impact this will have on the Croquet Club. But the only mitigation that will sustain the club is an equal facility located somewhere else. Is the tennis club going to pay for this? Will parks, forestry, and recreation pay for this? Why have we not seen any financial projections as to these costs? Realistically, unless forest, uh, parks, forestry, and recreation is prepared to add considerably to the money required for, from the tennis club to cover mitigation costs, I suggest there's no serious intent to truly mitigate the impact that the implementation of this uh, report will have on our club. Make no mistake, taking our courts away will mean the death of the North Toronto Lawn Bowling and Croquet Club. Our club is a competitive club with internationally ranked players who compete regularly in international tournaments throughout North America and Europe. Indeed, last July, two of our members represented Canada at the World Federation International Croquet Tournament in Brighton, England. The Canadian team won the gold medal. It's the equivalent of winning Wimbledon in the world of croquet. Why would the city wish to destroy this proud ambassador of the city? Competitive croquet is not a game that is widely known, but it's the perfect game for seniors and the handicapped, providing gentle exercise and mental stimulation. Why would the city ignore the mission statement of recreation that states its goal to provide recreational opportunities with special emphasis on seniors and the handicapped? Does destroying our club fulfill that mandate? The recreational facilities that exist in Lytton Park are designed to be appropriate to the size of the park and the infrastructure surrounding it. These recreational facilities were never designed to be a tennis center of excellence, to be a tennis enterprise, to be a facility that caters to 750 people. It would be wrong to attempt to make it so. Why hasn't the community been consulted on this proposed destruction of green space? Consultations were promised as part of the process. That process is incomplete. How can this committee make a rush decision based on a report that is half complete? A decision that affects both the park and a club that has been part of the community for over 100 years. I urge the committee to reject this proposal and so-called donation, and at the very least defer a decision until the community has been consulted. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jim. Uh, any questions? I hear uh, Vice Chair Doucette and uh, Councillor Madeline. Sorry, the audience can't ask questions. I'm sorry. Um, so we have two people. Okay, Vice Chair Doucette. So am I correct from hearing you that there hasn't been a public meeting consultation? With the so community? The, with the community. So Absolutely the none. We received the port 24 hours ago. Yes, I downloaded it just as I was yeah. leaving the office yesterday. Um, also, just let you know, I love croquet. I'm English, I love croquet. I also love lawn bowling, but anyway. Um, so I'm just trying to see, I'm, honestly, I'm not familiar with this part of town, so I'm trying to see on Google Streets uh, what is surrounding your park, and it looks like residential neighborhood. Yeah. That's correct? Homes. Okay, you could, got homes. Um, you, sorry, you could put the picture on the, on the overhead there. How, how long has your club been... Been Thank at, you. Uh, been there. How long have you been a lawn bowling club? And then I understand you changed to croquet, and I understand that because of the permit. Yeah, in total, 105 years. Oh wow! And 105 got, years. You've got two greens right now. Is that? You have two greens, which are sort of the minimum for international play. The lawn we played at in Brighton, England, had 24 courts. I know it's beautiful there. I've, yeah, I know. <laughs> I went to school there. Um, so in the report, which I read last night, um, it says that you do a tournament, um, which is basically where you get your financial support to help you. Yes, we have, that, we have three tournaments in, in the summer season. Mm -hmm. Plus, we go to a lot of international tournaments. Are there any other croquet clubs near you where you could relocate these tournaments and maybe do half the funding, half the profits with, a, with another club? Well, there's one other club uh, the, at Lawrence Park. And uh, in fact, the president of, or the representative from that club is here to, to speak okay. to that. 
Um, we have talked about amalgamation, mm -hmm. but it would make sense to amalgamate at um, uh, Lytton Park. Okay. Because, because they share the facility currently with the lawn bowlers at Lawrence Park, and, and they're bursting at the seams. So they need more capacity, and a merger uh, with that club makes absolute sense and would solve any kind of concerns about underutilization uh, because it would increase the capacity, and we have the capacity to absorb them. But nowhere near 750 people. I mean, that is shocking to me, uh, uh, who's very familiar with that facility. I grew up on Strath Island Boulevard, spent all my years in this area, and there's no parking. You can see from that picture, there's no place to park. And having 750 people come to that facility creates an cr incredible safety problem, which, which uh, will be addressed in later deputations. Thank you very much for your answers. Appreciate All right, them. my pleasure. And uh, don't go away yet. Councillor Matlow has some questions for you. Sure. Hi. Hi. How many members do you, uh, do you have today? We have 30 members. Uh, as I said, we're struggling because uh, previous uh, budget problems that we had from, from uh, a download of, uh, I think it was a 10% reduction in parks and recreation uh, 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 budget was downloaded to the permit holders. So as a consequence, soccer teams, croquet clubs, lawn bowling clubs went out, went into bankruptcy. I mean, the damage that that caused to this city is, is, is still being felt. Yeah. And we have managed to hold on. And we are slowly building. We, we have increased our, our membership by about 30% in the past year. So what, what if, if the, if the courts were allowed to expand, what, what impact would it have to your sport uh, in the city? You mean if the tennis courts? The, club, the tennis courts, yes. It expanded? Yes. Well, apart from the, the huge influx of people in that area making, making uh, access that much more difficult, we would be unable to have tournaments because you have, you have to have a minimum of two, two uh, greens to have a tournament. No one is going to come to a tournament with only one green. You couldn't schedule it. You couldn't do it. Unlike Sarah, I don't know your sport well enough, yeah. so that's why I'm sure. asking. Sure. Yeah. So, so you need two greens to be able to hold a tournament. So yes. you wouldn't be able to hold the tournament uh, at, at Lydon Park? Uh, no, no. Okay. Uh, no, the club would die. We, we, I mean, we're not being dramatic there. We're saying that we couldn't, uh, dr uh, we couldn't attract international uh, players. Mm. They wouldn't want to come to one green uh, and spend their time waiting to play. You know, it's the nature of the game that, unlike tennis, where a game is over in, what, 40 minutes, uh, you know, some games go two, three hours. So it's the nature of the game that we, we, we need space and we need time. Last thing I wanted to thank you. Uh, the, the last thing I wanted to ask you about was you mentioned that you. When did you when did you get word about this? This well, that this recommendation was going to be on on this agenda. Well, we got the report 24 hours ago. Uh, we have had one meeting uh, where we were told that they had been in discussions with the tennis club for six months, and they finally decided that it was time maybe we should know about it. So we had a meeting last December where we had an opportunity to, uh, to the tennis club and to uh, Parks and Rec to lay out our issues. Mm -hmm. um, nothing really was said at that time uh, from the other um, uh, uh, attendees. It was more, it, was it more of a, like a feedback meeting? Like, were you ever told at that time that there may be recommendations eventually to expand the tennis courts and replace Oh, yes, we, we knew the proposal. Okay. We knew about the proposal, but we didn't know what the process was. We, we couldn't get information from Parks and Rec or anybody as to what we needed to do to fight this, what we need, what was the process. We still don't know what the process is, uh, except that a report came out 24 hours ago and we've had hardly any time to, to, to respond to it. Has the local councillor been involved in this discussion and, and have, they, have they expressed an opinion or a position on this? We have not heard a word from her. Uh, she, uh, she I, I, we're not sure if she, she attended or it was a representative 
of her office attended the initial meeting. Unfortunately, I couldn't be there, but uh, uh, a, a subsequent speaker will, uh, was there. And um, she didn't say a word, Thank I you. understand. She just took notes. So I, I think it was a representative of her office. Right. I don't think she was there. But, but you know, that's problematic as well because unless I'm mistaken, she is a member of the tennis club and so has a direct conflict of interest in this right. whole well, matter. I, I, I don't, we, don't know, we don't know that to be true. So. We, we don't know that, but I would like to ask that question okay. of the tennis club. Thank you. Um, and anyone else have questions? I had a uh, question. So your membership, uh, uh, Jim, is um, 30 members. And then I know that I, I, have, I represent the beach, and we have two lawn bowling clubs on the water actually, they're quite lovely. Um, and you know, we've had this, this has come up in, in this term and last term of council of, of you know, it's um, how to recruit a younger generation millennials into lawn bowling. And I know, um, you know, some of the clubs are doing a mentorship night or they're doing like, I don't know, um, they get a, um, a liquor license and they have food and, and beverages and they do a great Gatsby mm -hmm. lawn bowling event or things like that. And I'm just wondering if your club has thought about that or you've initiated that or that's something that you might ab consider for recruitment. Ab absolutely. We're involved in all those initiatives. Um, we, we have had uh, people come out. Uh, it's it's I don't know what's happening with seniors. I don't know what they do with their time. It's very hard. We'll get them out, but it's very hard to get them to commit. Uh, you know, they come out, they'll have a great time. They'll say, oh, great, we'll be back for sure. And then you never see them again. Uh, it's not that they don't like the game. They love the game. Everybody loves croquet. They have childhood associations with it. Although the game we play is, is, is somewhat different, but it's basically the same. You're getting a ball through a hoop. Um, but where we really resonate is with people who are unable to play with, uh, you know, their normal sports, like uh, the tennis player who has the bad back, he can't play anymore. You know, the, uh, this is a very gentle sport. I myself have a handicap where I have a paralyzed right leg. I wear two braces on my leg. I couldn't play any other sport. I found croquet and it has kept me fit and it's kept me mentally alert. It's been my salvation. And this is why I'm so passionate about it. And, and to, to, to cater to the middle age generation demographic ignores the fact that we are anticipating over five million seniors in Ontario once the baby boom generation, uh, and in fact, they've begun to retire already. Where are the facilities for seniors? The other problem that we have is that unlike tennis courts and that kind of thing, we have, we have the problem of death. Members die, you know, or they fall sick, or they can't play anymore. So we, we're losing members constantly that way, so we're always struggling to, to keep up. But, but to eliminate this opportunity in this very small, gentle location uh, that serves the community, I, I think is a serious error. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks for sharing, that's helpful. All right, seeing uh, no more questions, we, we thank you for your deputation for coming all the way down. Thank you very much. And next I would like to call Hollis Reinhardt and she's also from the North Toronto Croquet Club. Or, sorry, he. Yes, uh, Hollis. Sorry, I know Hollis is a female. Um, sorry about that, Hollis. Hollis is actually a last name. Oh, wow. Given to me as a first name. Nice. All right, um, Hollis, so I'll start your time and welcome to our committee. Thank you. Thank you for uh, hearing my deputation. Uh, I am the vice president of the North Toronto Croquet Club. And I want to begin by drawing your attention to your mandate as expressed in your publications which says, your vision statement says, in 2017, every Torontonian has better access to quality recreation programs in their community. Every Torontonian 
quality recreation programs. The question before us now, will this be true in 2019? Secondly, the Restoration Service Plan has as one of its aims specific focus on children, youth, seniors, low-income families, newcomers, and people with a disability. I'm here to speak on behalf of seniors. I'm sure the committee is aware that the Ontario government has shown special concern for the needs of seniors, predicting that in the next, that by 2041, the number of seniors in the province will increase by nearly 5 million. 5 million seniors. 25% of the population will be seniors. My question is, what recreational facilities are you providing for these seniors, or indeed for us seniors? I can tell you that they will not all be playing tennis. I was an avid tennis player myself from the age of 12 until about 65. Then my knees began to go, and I switched to badminton. And then, uh, after about 10 years, my other knee went, and I could no longer play badminton. Fortunately, I had played croquet since I was a child and had developed a keen interest in the game over the years. Keep in mind that this was no longer the backyard game I had played as a child, but a serious, strenuous, intellectually challenging game which is widely played in Canada and throughout the world. The U.S. Croquet Association, for example, has over 9,000 members. National and international tournaments are played all over the world, including in Toronto at our club. And it is possible even for seniors to excel at this sport. In illustration of this fact, and to brag a bit, I won my first tournament and became the former champion of Vermont at age 70. And I have won several tournaments since then. Now, I no longer enter tournaments, but I get to play with players who do, and that continues to make the game interesting and challenging for me. Now, what is the Parks Department offering me and the millions who will follow me? Why, they are taking away my club and depriving me of the challenge of meeting serious players who are dedicated to a serious game of croquet. Make no mistake, if deprived of one of our courts, our club will die. We will no longer be able to hold tournaments, and the serious players who like such a challenge will go elsewhere. They certainly will not come to Toronto. And if our club dies, there will be no place for those 4.1 million, or the smallest fraction thereof, to go to play. There's only one other club in Toronto which offers croquet on our scale, and it is near to overflowing. And yet croquet is an ideal sport for seniors. The North Toronto Tennis Club members themselves, when their knees wear out, will be happy to have croquet available. Consider their future needs. In conclusion, I may have been somewhat lighthearted in some of my comments, but I assure you I am deadly serious. Competitive croquet is an important recreational opportunity for seniors for whom other sports have been ruled out. And for young people too. Most of the players from Scotland and Ireland with whom I have played have been young. I live in hope that this sport will catch on among our young. In the meantime, however, I call on the Parks Department to live up to its mandate and focus on the needs of seniors, among others who require special attention. In the words of a wise man, Plan for the young, and you exclude the old. Plan for the old, and you include everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hollis. Any questions of the deputy? Seeing none, that means you were um, very clear in your <laughs> deputation. <laughs> Thank, Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Next up is John R. Peets. John Peets. Here we are. Yeah. I have uh, some supplementary information. But I don't want to get to 
Okay, so just stay where you are and the clerks will come to you. Thank you. We have uh, excellent customer service here. <laughs> and um, welcome. Oh, thank you. So the clerks are just coming along to you. Thank you very much. And they'll distribute it for yep. you. Well, thank you for the opportunity to speak here today. My name is John Peets. I've resided with my family at 228 Lytton Boulevard for the past eight years. And I drew the short straw this morning in the neighborhood. No, I'm kidding. Um, the purpose of my time here today is to request on behalf of my fellow residents of Lytton Park community a complete rejection of the Parks and Environment recommendation of staff or at the very least the provision for a reasonable deferral of the matter for the following reasons. There are many serious issues, one of which you see on the screen behind you, to consider as a result of this proposal, some of which include traffic volume studies due to the increased membership, and I'm shocked to hear the number this morning of 750. Uh, there are ongoing effects that we're feeling on Lytton Boulevard and Alexander Boulevard due to the diversion of traffic by way of the crosslinks uh, uh, construction. There are insufficient parking conditions. There's excessive noise from Avenue Road. I'm not sure if you're aware, but 24 to 57,000 cars a day go along Avenue Road and the park and the tennis courts and the lawn bowling and croquet facility back on to uh, Avenue Road. There are issues such as groundwater drainage, water table status, tree studies, lighting, alternative uses, and other important issues that need to be seriously fleshed out before any proposal moves forward that would change the nature of this green space. By giving our community the time, we will produce an appropriately developed proposal for the future, which may or may not entail the preservation of the status quo. Who knows? The residents of Lytton Park have not had, until today, the opportunity to discuss this matter with any elected representatives, despite our best efforts. Emails have not been returned. Phone calls have not been returned. It wasn't until this past Sunday that news spread among the uh, the neighborhood that an upcoming Parks and Environment Committee meeting was be held here at City Hall and we scrambled to canvas for opinions and I can tell you firsthand I did that canvassing and to a person not one resident was supportive of this initiative not one no advanced circulars no public notice of intention no letters of information or request uh, for input by the community were given to property owners by the city or the tennis club pertaining to this matter, and I ask, why not? Why didn't they ask us for our opinion? They did not consult us. This was a complete ambush. It appears that the decision has been made without community grassroots input from the very beginning. We've yet to meet with our counselor, her executive assistant, or members of her staff about this matter. <laughs> For your information, the General Manager of Parks and Forestry and Recreation, as my colleague said just earlier, re re produced his report yesterday at approximately 1 p.m. Not fair. Until yesterday, we had no transparency, no information with respect to the plans of the tennis club as a matter, as that matter had been a topic of discussion between the boards of the tennis and the croquet club, Parks and Rec, and a select group of privileged individuals who've either chosen to recuse themselves or remain on, uh, in a conflict of interest. Why were we kept in the dark? Because the plan is inconsistent with the neighborhood. Sorry, am I, am I boring you guys? No. No, I'm, at, I'm actually thinking of a motion to support what you're asking. Oh, okay, I'm yeah, sorry. sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, <laughs> I don't know how the city works. Pardon That's me. That's okay. Everyone, Let everyone me be else very is clear. listening. Thanks. Let me be very clear. This change in use should not be about the aspirations of a private tennis club, small group of board of directors and players that wish to control the greater community's enjoyment of our wonderful green space. Who are they to decide that the green space allocation is based on a half-baked financial plan that isn't fully funded? Sadly, we've been all been led down a path that is completely backwards. Lytton Park was designed to be a mixed-use community with appropriate size facilities and services for the various age demographics. With the proposal before the PE committee, it is effectively attempting to bully one of Toronto's heritage sports pitches. The Lytton Park lawn bowling pitch used by the Croquet Club is a special and valued feature of our community for more than 100 years. The Croquet Club deserves an equal opportunity to enhance its membership. Give it time. 
Membership at the tennis club is temporarily swelling due to the renovations underway at Sir Winston Churchill Tennis Club at Spadina and St. Clair, which will reopen in 2020. They have 10 courts. Let's wait for normal conditions to settle before we do the irreversible based on temporary demand from temporary members who live 10 kilometers away from our community. Full utilization at the tennis court is also a fabrication. At peak times and non-peak times, the tennis club are often unused, and in the circular that I provided, there are actual pictures from two days ago at 8 p.m. where two courts remained empty. We believe there's a serious lack of fairness to the residents and a blatant disregard for the Croquet Club's right to keep its permit in good standing. I'm almost finished. And conclude its amalgamation discussions with the Lawrence Park Bowling and Croquet Club, which may result in a healthy membership at Lytton Park that thrives well into the future. I ask the Chair again, what is all the rush? With an amalgamation in place, tennis at Lawrence Park could be expanded. I'm a tennis player. I love tennis. Um, I'll be happy to, to take my four-minute drive to that club and play tennis there. Ample parking facilities are there at Lawrence Park to accommodate an increase in tennis play. It's a perfect solution for everyone's aspirations. Just it's four minutes away. And one final thought. In summary, please refuse or defer this recommendation. Let the community discuss all of the important issues of this proposal and decide in conjunction with its councillor and the Parks and, and Environment Committee what becomes of the green space, not after the fact, and certainly not based on the ambitious few in the tennis court business with dubious financial plans. Let's start this over from the beginning and do it right. There's no rush. Demand will be there. It has been for okay. nearly 100 years. As a community, let's determine together the best way forward. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any questions of the deputant, uh, Chair, Advice Chair Desat? So I'm just looking at the presentation. Um, maybe you're not the right person for me to ask the question. No, does the lawn bow, oh, sorry, does the croquet have lights? Do they play at night? No. Well, not, oh, not they're nodding, late, sorry. Not late at night, but yeah. in the early evening, yeah. And the tennis club has lights as well? Yes, it does. Okay. All Very right. bright, and they shine right into the back of my house. So but, both clubs can play into the evening because of lights? Mm -hmm. Okay, all right, thank you. All right, any other questions? Thank you, that was, they're great graphics. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next up is Daniel Greenberg. Hello. Hi Daniel, Council. how are you? Welcome. Good, thank you. Madam Chair, Councillors, my name is Daniel Greenberg. I am too a resident of Lytton Park. I live at 322 Lytton Boulevard block and a half from the tennis club. I'm also a member of the tennis club, which is a private organization, not. It is a public club. It is not for profit and is not part of a private organization, unlike my neighbor has insisted. Also, this club is not looking to destroy the lawn bowling or croquet. It is taking one of their courts. The interests of international peoples and people that come to Toronto are far less important than the interests of children and seniors and the rest of the citizens of the City of Toronto, especially those who are members of our local community of Lytton Park, which is very small compared to the rest of the city. Highway 11, which is, I believe, a provincially funded roadway, goes right past this tennis court and croquet and, and um, lawn bowling club. The no there is no noise factor that would be increased from the cricket, croquet, that is less in tennis than this massive highway, which we all deal with in our daily occurrences in the City of Toronto. This is a big highway. There is no added capacity. Finally, with respect to the number that the president of the croquet and club has said of 750, there's a maximum capacity of tennis players that can play at any one time on a tennis court. It is not a croquet or lawn bowling where you can have massive numbers of people playing at the same time. The maximum number of tennis players, as we all know, is four. Four times five is 20. There is not 750 people that are going to show up at any one time to play tennis. There's a lot of disinformation that you're receiving from the Croquet Club and ratepayers and residents of the very finite area of Lytton Park 
around the actual park itself. These individuals knew well and good that there was a park with tennis courts and or croquet and lawn bowling, as well as a major highway outside their door. There, is, there should be no confusion of the fact that this club exists, that tennis is incredibly popular compared to a 30-member club that plays croquet and lawn bowling or lawn bowling, and that the interests of the community in general are best served by tennis and not a sport that not very many people play, perhaps 30 only. Finally, my experience at the club has, with my children, we are family members and both my daughters come and play tennis as well as my wife. Most weekends, we don't have a cottage. We spend the entire weekend in the city, at the club, back and forth. We walk, we don't drive. There is not a lot of parking there, I understand that, but the membership is drawn from the local area. This is a local club with local people. And carpetbaggers from other parts of the city discussing Sorry, Lombolding. sorry, sorry. Um, just that terminology is, is not welcome here, carpetbaggers. Okay. So if you could just refrain from that disparaging That's comment, thank fine. you. So for individuals coming from outside of the area to Lombol, as well as other countries of the world, it should not be the consideration of this council. It should be the consideration of children. Massive quantities of children play tennis on three courts every day. The capacity is at its limit. There are, the destruction of a, another club is not the intention of the tennis club. There's two very, very large green pads of grass. That grass is maintained by chemicals and other abilities of the city, Parks and Recreation Department, to maintain a very interesting color of grass as well as the nature of that surface. Clay courts will not create an additional uh, capacity for groundwater runoff that isn't absorbed by the current construction of the courts in a green space. There's not an impact in that way. What I would recommend is the understanding of this committee that this is an issue that is not new. This has been an ongoing discussion for many years and that the club, the tennis club, requires in order to support the members of the community as well as children and the development of scarce resources to be allocated amongst the community in its best and most appropriate use is best served by tennis and not by lawn bowling or croquet. I thank you and yield my remaining 10, minutes, 10 seconds. Thank you very much. Any questions, Councillor Layton? Yes, thank you very much. I was able to find um, the cost for membership for the Croquet Club online, but not for the tennis club. What is the, the membership? annual membership fee. Very reasonable. I believe as a family member, I pay $320 a year. No court fees. It's the most affordable sport that my family can play. And do you, um, I know that there's some public time on the courts. Do you pay a, a permit fee to the city for use of the, of the existing three courts? <clears throat> The, the club pays a permit fee yeah. every year. Do you know year. what that, that fee is, do you? It's, it's okay if you don't, that's fine. Okay. okay, okay, great, thank you. Anything further? Nope. Thank Sorry, you Sorry, only, only um, councillors can ask questions. I actually had a question, uh, Daniel. Um, so do you ever, does, in your experience, has the tennis club and the croquet lawn bowling club, have you ever done any events together or meetings together or conversations together or is it just completely separate? No, they're very oh. separate clubs with separate memberships. Um, there is no general communication. They very rarely find people at the Croquet Club. It's hard to, maybe on a weekend, on a Saturday, once in a while, but it's very, very quiet and uh, unapparent how they would possibly require two massive pads. Okay, thank you very much. Oh, sorry, no. Oh. I should have done you first. Uh, visiting Councillor, Councillor Wong Tam. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. In, I did not have a question until um, uh, the, the questions were asked. Uh, thank you very much, sir, for your deputation. I want to just ask uh, a question regarding the process. Um, there were speakers before you who, uh, who said that they were not notified, that they were not consulted, um, and that it's literally blindsided them. Um, but your organization seems to be very deep in consultations, have had meetings and discussions with, I'm assuming, the council or perhaps city staff. Um, 
was why was your neighbor, the uh, the Croquet and Lawn Bowling Club, not part of those discussions? So I'm not here representing the club. I'm representing myself as a resident of Lytton Boulevard. No, I guess I'm asking but, because you're a you, you seem to be a very active member yes. of the tennis club. Yeah. So I'm assuming that there would have been some discussions among its membership that there was going to be a desire to expand the facility, expand. Uh, uh, tennis uh, uh, space and uh, and the site of interest would have been the croquet lawns. Um, so there would have been some natural, I would imagine, neighbors talking to each other and, and members using the same physical green space uh, talking to each other that, hey, this is coming down the pipeline, wanted you to know. Right. That never took place? Well, my understanding, and it would be hearsay if, me, if I was going to speak to it since I wasn't part of any of those meetings, my understanding is for a number of years there's been discussions. Uh, our councillor, Carmichael Gray, had meetings with both the Croquet Club and the, or the Lawn Bowling Club, Croquet Club, and the Tennis Club, and that those meetings were to discuss the possibility of this expansion of the Tennis Club. With respect to the neighborhood, I don't know anybody personally in the neighborhood that does belong to, attend, or have anything to do with the Croquet Club. Many of my members, my neighbors are members or have been members in the past of the Tennis Club, but to my knowledge, none of my neighbors are actual members of the Croquet Club. When, when did you know about the report that is before us today? The report came out yesterday, I understand that. I know that the since last November that there was a dis there have been discussions of this and that the that the tennis club had submitted a report or a their desire to the committee to the sorry to the parks and recreation department as well as spearheading this with the councillor i've also spent part of the f of the spring lobbying for this with not this level of government because we had already had communications with the councillor, but during the provincial election, having discussions with each of the candidates for provincial parliament and received uh, support from some and as well as uh, interest from the other candidates. Our current member of parliament, a member of provincial parliament, was highly in favor of our continuing use of the tennis club and expansion of it to include an additional pad and two courts. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Any other questions? All right. Thank you very much, Daniel. Next up is Donna Starkman. Welcome, Donna. Thank you. Um, I live at 205 Lytton Boulevard which is um, right across from the lawn bowling. And um, I've lived there since 1990. So um, first of all, in terms of uh, process, I just heard about this proposal a few days ago when some emails started circulating. It took me a little while to um, get the time to read some of the material. Um, I did send in a letter. I'm not sure if it's in your package, um, but I'm, I wasn't uh, totally up to speed, and I'm not completely up to speed in terms of uh, the history of this proposal. But I'm here as a, um, uh, a resident who lives in the neighborhood and right across from the, the, um, the site. So first of all, in terms of the history, I, th I don't know if uh, even the people from Parks and Rec did a site visit. Um, when we talk about uh, the, the, the park and the green land in the, in the neighborhood, it's actually, um, it's not a large park. There's sort of a series of little parkettes that are all actually very charming. And what I put in my letter is that um, what's very special and unique about the neighborhood is that it has a, a mix of uses, not in one large park, and there's, there's no parking uh, facility. Um, if, if you drive into the area to use any of these um, uses, you need to park on the road, and the road is actually, as you can see, windy. So the, in, any increased parking on the, in that area is actually dangerous to the residents and 
into the traffic, but it, it does go on and it's permitted. So you have one small park that's used for children and a playground. That's right at the corner of Lytton and Avenue Road. It's recently been upgraded and we get a lot of use from that and it's lovely. You do have the tennis courts, um, which I'll, I'll speak to, um, the tennis club. That's another area that's set back that then rolls into um, the, the lawn bowling, which then when you cross the street becomes what I call the dog park because there's nothing there but people walk their dogs and can let them loose in that park. So you have what is a really very unique um, se series of little parks that have been, I think, brilliantly over the years um, used to provide different uses to different residents. Um, there are the seniors, there's the lawn bowling, and when I first moved into the area, I had never seen lawn bowling, and I was, think, I was like, wow, this is unbelievable. Like, it's so historic and so beautiful, and something's actually unique to Toronto. It does service seniors, and I thought one day, and I'm approaching that age, I might join <laughs> when I had the time. Um, so I, I think that to talk about making any changes, um, that will affect that balance, the, the tennis, the, the play area, and the lawn bowling croquet is a very, very, very serious proposal. And I also have to say that I'm, I'm um, surprised, I've lived in the area for a long time, to say that there's this burgeoning demand for tennis in the neighborhood surprises me because um, we, we did join, we, used, we joined when our kids were younger, the tennis club, but in reality you didn't have to join because it was underutilized. You could just go and use, like joining, since it's a public court, joining gave you priority, but not joining um, didn't prevent you from using the tennis courts. So it, it wasn't necessary. And really even now, there are many times when those tennis courts are not busy. In prime times, even on the weekends, people go to cottages. Um, and I, I, I am not objecting to the idea in the city of Toronto, if, um, proper information is gathered um, that the, the city at, at large, the core where, where we live in the surrounding neighborhood needs more tennis courts. That ought to be looked at, but it should be looked at and placed in a way where there is parking and where um, it's not a zero sum, where increasing the tennis courts takes away from somebody else. And, and actually sort of destroys a neighborhood. This is not a large park set uh, away from the neighborhood. The lawn bowling is nestled and surrounded by houses, and though we all benefit, not only from the use, but from the beauty and for the, from the green land, which is almost a ravine. I'm not sure it's technically a ravine, but it is, it is sunken and it's a ravine, like it's very, very unique. So the, the, what I'm... Um, okay, so I'll, to sum up, what I'm saying is there has been really, I'm here on behalf of the resident to say there was no consultation. There might have been some conversation between the lawn bowling and the tennis club and the city and parks. We had no notice. There has been no public meeting. There has been no consultation. And I think that clearly people are coming in from other areas to use the tennis club, maybe because Winston Churchill, 10 courts have been shut down. That will reopen but to take away from somebody, from some organization that exists, that benefits the whole community um, aesthetically and in usage and, and um, because of a temporary situation of demand, um, it would be wrong. Um, we need consultation if it's gonna move ahead at all, but I, I, I implore you, you know, to first of all refuse this and throw it back and say if tennis courts are needed, look for an appropriate place in a city and that this is not an appropriate place. No. Thank you very much. Um, and I have a question for you from Vice Chair Doucette. So what I'm hearing from you is you'd like a community public meeting for the neighbors so you also can ha hear what the proposal is and have a say in what happens moving forward. Is that right? Well, that, that's the, if it can't be refused outright now, I would say that, that we have to go through a proper process where every, everybody can be heard, not just a special interest group of tennis players in the neighborhood. I think it is not to say that pro approve it now and we'll consult later is not, is not right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Any other questions of the deputants? Seeing none, thank you very much, Donna. And 
Last but not least is Philip Parsons. Hi, Philip. Good morning. Welcome. Thank you. Let's have a drink. Good morning. Um, <clears throat> I'm the Vice President of Croquet at Lawrence Park Lawn Bowling and Croquet Club, <coughs> excuse me, which is the only other real place that you can play, <coughs> excuse me, croquet in Toronto. Um, <coughs> I've, <coughs> sorry, I shouldn't have had that drink. Um, That's okay. <coughs> Stop your time. Thank you. <coughs> I've played croquet for 30 years. Um, <clears throat> I would say it's my passion. My wife says it is my obsession. Um, uh, just a few comments before I <clears throat> get to my proper deposition. Uh, before I was talking about numbers, you know, on the croquet pads, putting hundreds of people or whatever. The tennis gen gentleman on, who played tennis, you know, doesn't know croquet, admittedly. You can put two games on the same court, and you can play doubles. So with the two pads, the maximum number you can have playing at once is 16. It was alluded to, games can take hours. So you're not going to have mo tons of parking problems because the maximum is 16 people playing, and that's when they are crowded. Okay. Um, another thing with numbers that um, kind of confused me is I heard about 750 people um, the potential at the tennis club. I also heard, I thought the gentleman said 700 at the tennis club, and he said with joining, um, with adding the two courts, they follow the city guidelines of 125 people per court. Well, my math would say right now three courts at 125 is 375, but they have 500 members. If you went to five courts, you'd have 625 members. But he's talking either 700 or not, it's also 750, so the numbers don't add up for me. Anyways, uh, I want to say, believe it or not, I'm a tennis player, you know, so I know both sports. Um, my, mom is a, my mom was a tennis player. My mom played tennis until she was 85. Then she had a shoulder injury and couldn't play anymore. Guess what she does now for physical exercise? Okay, yeah, good guess, you know. But she, she's been playing 30 years like I have. You know, her first passion was tennis, and she'd do that any day that she could over croquet, but now that tennis is eliminated, it's croquet, and she loves it. You know, bridge and croquet keeps her going. Lawrence Park is at capacity, or actually over capacity for croquet. In fact, last night we had a competitive night at Lawrence Park, Six of our members had to go to North Toronto and play because there was not room for them. We're looking at doing a merger with, with North Toronto out of necessity because we just don't have the capacity to play at Lawrence Park the way we could. To thrive, a club needs two greens. Two greens in the same location. One at North Toronto and one at Lawrence Park won't work. It's like having the tennis club, you know, a couple of miles apart, you put them, you say, well, you can do function, we'll have a social. Okay, now you're playing over there, then when you're finished, drive back here for your next game. It just wouldn't work. You need to locate, you need two courts in the same place. If any tennis courts are to be built, as I think John mentioned, would, Lawrence Park would be the place for it. Why? Because they've got parking, it's not going to impact things. But I didn't realize till this morning, they're looking to add two clay tennis courts. They've got hard courts in North Toronto. You know what they have at Lawrence Park? Clay courts. Oh, you know, this is a different way of maintaining clay courts and stuff. They already have the tools, the knowledge, the expertise. And in fact, they wanted to expand years ago and that's why croquet got popular at uh, Lawrence Park because they wanted to protect their club and they invited croquet in and we flourished. We have, I think, 17 new members this year. You know, I am fairly good, it's my passion, I grow the club. We had 15 new members last year, we have 17 new members this year. We merge with North Toronto. The problem will not be 
that the greens are not being used. We went from playing two nights a week and Saturdays at Lawrence Park. This year we play Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays, and that's for organized play. Members are encouraged to and do play at other times. If they're retired and say, hey, do you want to play Tuesday afternoon? Sure, they go off and they play. So the courts get utilized. And back to the point that I said earlier, the maximum you'd have is 16, so you're not going to have crazy parking or driving situations that are being created because you can't have that many people playing at one time. Um, if you proceed and take one green away from North Toronto, they will fold. You can't run a club with one because most of the revenue is from the tournaments. That keeps them alive. You take away all that revenue, they fold. As Lawrence Park is at capacity, or I would argue above capacity, if you do this, you're shutting down, you're capping croquet in Toronto. There's no other place to play. People have tried to start clubs, and you could go to Toronto Island, but you have to move there and be a resident to play, which is kind of a steep cost. You could join the Toronto Cricket Club. They have a pretty good croquet program, but it's either ten dollars or $20,000 initiation. Then you have your annual fee for playing and things as well. One oh. final, sorry, one final thought, Philip. If you yeah. So you, not only are you destroying croquet, you're capping it for Toronto, and I don't understand what the rush is. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Any, qu Any questions of Philip? I would just, I have one. And mm -hmm. So Philip, you, you've increased your membership mm -hmm. over the last couple of years, and I just wonder how you did that, what kind of outreach? Um, Spadina House has an annual Gatsby party. We go there and we teach croquet to the public every year. For the last five or six years, I'm a curler. I have a night for curlers at the croquet club. And it's funny, like the Spadina House, out of doing it all those years, we have two members. One of which started when he was 10, he's now 14. So you don't have to be um, retired to play croquet. I have two boys who played as kids and have played in their 20s. So, and we have new members from the curlers who are about 30-ish. They like it so much, there's now five of them. Um, I spend hours a week doing things. I do a newsletter so everyone knows what's going on. I've had members who've been sick who say, I still feel part of the club because I know what's going on because of that. Uh, it's funny, I've got a whole list. I can't, it's not coming to my mind, but I do a ton of things to promote it. Uh, anyone who walks by, you know, getting them to come in and try. A uh, million different things. Thank That's you. a labor of love. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, anyone else? All right. Thank you very much for your uh, deputation. And that's all we have on our speakers list, unless there was someone else. All right, now, so now we'll bring it into committee and we will ask questions of staff if anyone has questions of staff. Uh, Councillor Doucette. Thank you very much. Thank you also to the speakers. Um, staff, how, what consultation has happened out there? I understand that there's been meetings with the tennis club. I understand that. I understand at some point in time, I believe the tennis club has talked to the croquet club, but what consultation has been done, public consultation? So, uh, Councillor, through the chair, uh, the process as we've laid it out is that we first have to solve the provision question about whether or not uh, one type of sport or the other should take precedence in this space. Uh, as the report outlines, there is an intention to do further consultation on issues like design, parking, all of those other things. Uh, however, we felt that without making the provision determination, uh, going to consultation may just sort of raise the same questions that uh, Council has already in some ways determined through the facility master plan, but I think as we've seen through today's discussion may not be as clearly decided as, as that. Thank you very much. That was my only question. Anyone else with questions? Uh, Councillor Layton. Thank you very much. I don't have any tennis clubs or croquet clubs in, in my ward, so can I, can I just understand, there, there's a fee associated with their exclusive use of both these sites. So the tennis club, can you tell me what their fees are? So through the chair, uh, the tennis club fees, which are approved in, the, uh, in our fee uh, schedule by council every year, are charged uh, by the court uh, at, uh, so a lit court is, uh, 
$596 a year, an unlit court, $74 a year, and then there's a separate fee for the clubhouse. So the tennis club fees vary by the size of and the number of courts. Lawn bowling uh, is a different issue, and several years ago, as a number of the deputants have noted, there was a harmonization of all the lawn bowling fees across the city as they hadn't been uh, amalgamated or harmonized since amalgamation. We had fees that ranged from $500 to $16,000, so they were harmonized at $3,500 a year, approximately. $3,500 a year? That's correct. And there is a clubhouse uh, at Lytton Park, too? For yes. the uh, lawn yeah, bowling? that's correct. And there's a fee for that? Uh, it's included in the 35. It's included in the 35. Yeah. The uh, tennis club, so can I just, the lit is $596, the unlit is $74? That's correct, just because the usage of an unlit court is substantially less than a lit court. So as an example, the, the North Toronto Tennis Club I have here, which has three lit courts and a clubhouse, is approximately $864 a year. 1800 $1,800, sorry. Okay, and the fee for the clubhouse at Lytton Park? Uh, for the tennis the or tennis for the club. lawn bowling, it's included in the $3,500. And for the tennis club? It's an additional $71 a year, $74 a year. Now, there is some public time on the tennis courts. Uh, through the chair, that's correct. Through the council approved tennis policy, there's a requirement for public access to the tennis courts. There's also a requirement around the fees, uh, the membership fees for the tennis courts. Uh, and in addition, many of the tennis clubs, which has noted are nonprofits, um, also contribute to uh, the maintenance and further upgrade of the courts and facilities through their own fundraising efforts. So we have uh, so the clubhouse itself, we do the capital work on it, right? Through the chair, that's correct. We would do the standard sort of base capital work that's required, and if any of the clubs would require anything above and beyond that base, that would be done through the fundraising efforts of the club. Is there any planned capital work for this particular clubhouse, either of these clubhouses? So my understanding, it's basic state of good repair uh, work. The roof on the clubhouse at the, at the lawn bowling club needs to be replaced at some time soon. And that would be the city's cost. City's cost. Um, the lawn bowling club, is there public time guaranteed in the, in whatever agreement we have? Uh, it's, uh, my understanding through the agreement is that it's exclusive use to the members of the club. So what's the tennis club policy for, what's our tennis club policy for, um, for public use? Just checking the policy, my memory is, six uh, hours. six hours. Six prime time hours, sorry, I have it here. A week? Can I, can we? Sure. Can I just check the policy for yep. you? I don't want to give you the wrong information. Great. Thank you. That's all my questions. It's several hours a week. Regardless, I'll just get the specific number and let you know. Okay. Thanks. Six. six. Councillor Doucette is sure it's six, so we're going with Councillor Doucette. <laughs> my memory is, is, uh, is, is, is six, two, yeah. and it has to yeah. be prime time use, so it can't be sort of seven o'clock in the morning or, or nine o'clock at night. Okay, anyone else with questions? Councillor Wong Tan. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, my question is regarding process and the, the concerns that uh, both the Croquet Club as well as some of the residents on Linton uh, who appeared before us today have said that they were not notified. In your report, it says that you actually had a conversation with the Croquet Club and they did flag some issues that might be of concern, and I think there were some recommendations and language in the report that might address that. Um, but for the residents um, along Linton, as well as some of the members who said they were not um, uh, uh, consulted, number one, when was the consultation with the uh, Croquet Club, when did that take place? And number two, why were the local residents along Linton not notified? So through the chair, um, the, there's been ongoing conversations as, as, all, as all the deputants have noted for several months now. Uh, we note and through the deputations, um, there isn't agreement between the two clubs on, on a path forward. Uh, and we're quite aware of that. The report is seeking permission to, um, to accept a donation to change the use of the court. As Matthew has indicated, Prior to any of that happening, there would have to be a broader base community consultation with the community before the project actually moved forward, and that would be done in collaboration with Parks, Forestry, and Recreation. So there has not been a broad-based public meeting on this. There's been several meetings with both of the clubs and some of the members of the clubs. 
Would it be recommendable to defer this matter so to allow the community to do proper consultation and to, for the councillor to, to get involved and help mitigate uh, or sort of mediate uh, what, what the conflicts are? Through, through, through the chair, uh, you know, a number of the deputants have noted um, uh, their concern around due process and input into this. Uh, and this is the process where those concerns should come forward. So this would be that due process approach, which is why this report is before committee today. So uh, as far as going back and doing further consultation with the community, we would have no objection to that if that's the course that people want to want to take going forward. Then my final question is, if, uh, if, consult if some early consultations did take place with the Croquet Club, like their leadership, and they had already flagged some of those concerns uh, for you, um, why is this report even before us? So through the chair, uh, you know, in the course of our work, and certainly through some of the policy documents that have gone forward to council, like the facilities master plan, uh, and, uh, you know, we are looking to try and get the greatest utilization out of the park space that we have. So through the, the, the you know, examination of these, we were looking at a greater utilization through being able to expand through the tennis use, um, as noted, just because of the number of members that are involved. So our interest is in utilizing the space uh, as much as possible, and in doing that, um, it's sometimes not possible to have everyone agree on the course forward. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, now, members to speak. Councillor Matt Lowe. Put on the screen. Um, so, my motion is that consideration of this item be deferred until January 2019 to enable the general manager, parks, forestry, and recreation to consult with members of the community, interested parties and organizations, and the local councillor. Uh, I come from this from a perspective where I, I lived on Courtley Boulevard when I was a kid and I know the park well and I grew up playing tennis. Um, as my senior father continues remarkably to do today. And um, I also fully recognize the um, dearth of opportunity for um, tennis players to be able to play that sport across the city, along with many other clubs, by the way. You talk about you know, baseball, a number of different sports. We just don't have enough fields, not enough space for all the people who want to uh, participate in recreation. And that's, that's, a, that's a more global issue that we have in our city that we're not going to get into today. Uh, but I understand why that friction is created when everyone wants a little bit of what we don't have enough of. Um, so that's my vantage point. What's clear though is that um, members of the Crow K Club um, feel that their sport and their quality of life would be more, more than directly impacted, would be, would be devastated uh, if, if this went in this direction to replace their space, part of their space, with an expanded uh, tennis, uh, tennis space. I also am very empathetic to the argument that we have a growing seniors population and we do have to think ahead about how this growing demographic is gonna be able to uh, stay well, stay involved, stay included, and have places uh, that are genuinely age friendly and have sports and spaces that are genuinely age friendly. Um, but the reason that I move this motion in particular is really not so much about is are those who want to advocate for expanding the tennis courts right or wrong versus the croquet club and the community but i just i just think we this committee has been delivered a hot mess that hasn't been dealt with to be candid yeah um this should have been dealt with before it ever got here um the fact that there hasn't been a community meeting the fact that there hasn't been like real consultation with people would be directly impacted. Um, and then we'll, all of a sudden we're supposed to decide on their behalf before that work has been done is fundamentally wrong and not certainly how I think most of us like doing things in our communities. So um, this needs to go back to the community. The community has, I believe, a right to have their voices heard no matter what their voice will say. Um, there needs to be a real discussion, a genuine discussion about the impacts on the croquet club, the interest and the very genuine interest of the tennis club and the impact on the community and their quality of life before this moves forward. And I look forward to seeing the local councillor 
and the local organizations and the community work together to try to resolve this, and then it'll come back to council. The reason January is simply because there isn't another opportunity until then. Uh, so anyway, I, I hope that you will support this motion, and, uh, and, I, and I do hope that, uh, that the local councillor uh, will be engaged in this discussion in a way that brings um, parties together and, and tries to arrive at a resolution. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Matlow. Uh, any questions of the move and the motion? All right. Um, and Councillor Layton is next. Great. Thank you very much. I'll support uh, Councillor Matlow's motion. It, um, it, it, it's clear that we haven't exhausted the consultation process on, on the matter. Um, it would have been nice to have some advice from the local councillor who may have done uh, some, some more in-depth consultation. Uh, then, and, that, that could have helped advise us in, in, in this decision. Um, I will take a bit of a different uh, approach, though, to discuss exclusive use in our, in our city's parks. See, there was an opportunity for us to introduce a tennis club in Trinity Bellwoods Park. It has six courts. Um, the offer was there to improve a, a set of courts. Uh, the community rejected the idea, and that was because our, our facilities, our parks, really should be accessible to everyone. And regardless of how low we think $320 a year is, for, for many in our city, that's not low. And we, we do have programs in our rec, uh, our rec system that address issues of uh, in, income disparity. If people can't uh, afford it, they have options. Our community centers uh, that provide free programming, there's our welcome policy. Uh, there isn't in this case. And so we have two situations where, um, and I don't mean to, uh, to, to, to offend either the tennis club or the lawn bowling club in this, uh, it, because the city hasn't put forward another option where we would operate programs like this for, for, for a fee, but that, that then ensuring that uh, there, there are mechanisms for, for people with, uh, with lower incomes to access these, uh, the, these programs. Uh, and, I, and I think it's really unfortunate. Um, I just want to tell a quick story because I introduced a policy, a, 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 a proposition to City Council some some years ago about a paddling uh, yes. um, policy that the city could make a paddle-friendly city. And deep down in there, which never made its way to an actual policy change, was the idea that we should not leave it up to the not-for-profit sector or private sector to run canoe clubs. And that was because of an interaction I had with gold medalist uh, Adam Vancouverden, who's also a resident of the ward. He learned how to paddle in, uh, in Oakville, where the club was municipally run. And he would not have had access to a club like that in, in the city of Toronto uh, because of wh where his family came from and uh, the, the economic background they had. But he had that opportunity in Oakville because of those municipal coaches. He then went on to, to row in like four Olympics or to paddle in like three or four Olympics and bring home gold for Canada. Like that's what our early, an early intervention and rec program does. So I think the city should re-examine whether or not we should act, like I, I know it's more staff, I know it's more budget, uh, but, the, but the reality is that's what you get out of it. You get access to programs. Um, you also might find that, that you get to, to address some of these issues around competition for space a little bit more effectively. I would uh, remark uh, just, just one thing for the, uh, the, the, the lawn bowling um, uh, 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 groups out there. There is membership out there that want to play in sports that require that kind of facility. It might not be croquet that they like, but take a walk down to Fred Hamilton Park on any Wednesday night and see the number of young people and, and older people uh, sharing the game of bocce. Uh, and, and which has, you could probably figure out a way of, of having a mixed facility. I, I understand that's what Lawrence Park does with uh, lawn bowling. Uh, but there, there is demand there. Uh, but try to put a fence around it and try to charge. They're not having it. We got a bocce cordon. Thank you very much. Councillor Doucette. So thank you very much. I want to thank all the deputants for coming out today. This is a difficult decision. Um, I play tennis. Well, I did before I became a counselor and don't have time, but I used to play tennis. I actually played on my school team and we played on hard courts and I played on grass courts. Um, croquet, okay, I'm not a professional. I played in the back garden. 
but it's a great sport as well. Lawn bowling, I will admit, I do it once a year when Councillor Grimes, um, yeah, Councillor, um, not Grimes, Perks, sorry. Councillor Perks oh and I, we do a grudge match at a local lawn bowling, and it's fun, and they have an open house. I won this year, he won last year. Well, we have teams, we bring our MPPs and our MPs and our school trustees, and we all have these great grudge matches. But there's different people, each of these sports bring in different people. And yeah, I'm not as young as I was when I played tennis, and for the last time as well, many years ago. Maybe if I can't play tennis anymore because I have a knee injury from playing field hockey, I might go and do something like lawn bowling or um, croquet. We have to have the options out there. From reading this report, my concern is that if this moves forward, we would lose a club. That is a concern to me. When our permit fees went up to the 3,500, I lost a club. My club was made up of 46 members at that point. Half of them were children. So all those children suddenly lost the opportunity to play a sport. Okay, we made it into a community garden, so we, we used the area for something else. But those members, the seniors, most of the seniors were able to move to another club. Some of the children moved, but not everyone. So yes, getting new courts, believe me, sounds fantastic for the tennis. I understand that. I have two tennis clubs in my ward. They're always asking for more courts. We also fortunately have two public sets of courts, so the public can play beyond the six hours um, and have the opportunity. But we, as I say, if we do go through with this, we will lose a club. I think we need public, more public consultation. I know each club has had consultation. Understand that completely. But we are looking at a community. We are looking at a neighborhood. And I think one thing we might want to take into consideration is ask each of the clubs how far their members travel to get to their clubs. What would this mean in traffic? Looking at the pictures and looking on Google Street, there's not much parking at this location. So are your members walking? Are you encouraging members who come from further afield because there's not enough croquet, there's not enough tennis? I think that's something we may need to take into consideration. I know in my ward, again, when we add something, change something, tra traffic and parking is one of their biggest concerns. So really, on that note, I agree we should be deferring this. We should be just doing more, more consultation with the neighbors, not just the clubs, with the neighbors, see what we come up with. And so I will 100% support the, uh, the motion from Councillor Matlow. And I hope people can work together. And I think a, a joint social is a great way to go. <laughs> gets members for both of you, gets you working together. Someone playing tennis may want to go and do croquet and vice versa. So work together, you're in an amazing park You've got a playground, you've got young people, enjoy your community, but let's work together as a team. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor just said. Anyone else to speak? All right, well, I will, I'll just say that I, I'll be supporting Councillor Matlow's um, motion, which is, I think is uh, the measured and um, rational, logical way to go. Uh, it's unfortunate what we're hearing loudly and clearly is that the consultation just wasn't there. And I'm not sure, because I don't live in the area, and I haven't had full conversation with the local council what happened. Um, and um, it's unfortunate the local council could not be here today um, to help us navigate this, uh, but we will take the time and do it properly. And I want to thank the deputants for coming down, especially if it's your first time. Um, it takes a lot out of your day to come down. You're lucky it was the first item, because sometimes we're here till, till midnight, um, and you have to wait around all day, so it's great that you, you were the first item. I will say, you know, we're trying to talk, Council Doucette mentioned about working together. It's, it's really upsetting to see, you know, groups um, of neighbors who are, um, you know, we, we often have conflict in our life, but this kind of conflict about our green space. And so if there's a way to work together, I, I represent, as I said, the beach, we have the Balmy Beach Club, and in the Balmy Beach Club, there are many different um, um, groups, the, the, canoe, the canoers, the, the squash 
uh, group and the rugby group and the lawn bowlers. And believe me, we've had some uh, fireworks at our AGMs before with the different groups fighting for um, more access to the water, more access to the club, more access to the green space. And um, we all have to, you know, bend a little bit and find some wiggle room and uh, because we all have a love for the green space. It's fantastic that you all want to use it. And, and we are a city within the park um, and we, we want a uh, green space for everyone and as much access as we can. So with that, I will uh, support Councillor uh, Matlow's motion and we'll call for the vote. All in favor on that? Uh, do we want recorded or we're good? No. Unanimous, all right. And the item as amended, all in favor? Opposed, that carries. And so that's the end of that and we will look forward to hearing uh, how it comes back in, in January and, and good luck with your consultation. Thank you for coming. Next item up is um, PE 29.2, a draft by bio biodiversity strategy for Toronto. We're having a presentation on that. Okay, guys, sorry, if we could have members of the public, if they want to chat outside, because we have a presentation and a full agenda, but I appreciate um, you want to chat. That's great. Proceed the old-fashioned way. I apologize. You can follow along in the presentations that were given out. So my name is Jane Welsh. I'm the project manager for the environmental planning section of city planning, and I'm here with my colleague uh, Kelly Snow and Jane Winnegar, as well as uh, Boyka from Parks, Forestry and Recreation and Karen McDonald from the Conservation Authority. So the first piece is why is biodiversity important? And I think around this table... Jane, could you speak a bit more into the microphone? Yes, the deputants are, or the visitors are having a hard time 
hearing so you're great. Why is biodiversity important? Around this table, I think we all understand that. It's important to our health and well-being of the city, and a biodiverse ecosystem is a robust and resilient ecosystem. So we've been in the business of protecting biodiversity for a while. We updated our official plan a couple of years ago. It's in full force and effect, and we added 68 new environmentally significant areas, which you know. We also updated our policies to include things which you may not know about, so that all city building will um, be environmentally friendly based on the seasonal movement of migrating species, opportunities for habitat, the potential impacts of a changing climate on biodiversity and ecosystem health. And also, when we've been preparing our new and emerging secondary plans, we've been adding policies around biodiversity. For instance, Portlands, um, the new downtown plan, and the emerging um, Don Mills Crossing. So, this is really a collaborative effort, this draft. And I remind you that it is a draft so that we really welcome um, you know, innovative ideas and comments. We're gonna take this out on our road show and get a lot of comments and bring it back to you. Okay. We've received a lot of input and I have to say that especially we've received input, if you probably know around this table that we've produced a series of nine biodiversity booklets and that's been an incredible labor of love from numerous volunteers, as some of them are in the room today, uh, environmental groups and the Royal Ontario Museum. And they really, and this has really formed the basis for the draft um, actions that you see before you today. And we've also received input through the Chief Planner Roundtable on Biodiversity. So we've been building on this and the work of the Ravine Strategy and the Pollinator Protection Strategy to develop these draft actions. You all are probably familiar with the challenges we have to urban biodiversity, the loss of habitat, the loss of connections between our habitat patches, uh, a loss of species. We have a number of species at risk in the city of Toronto, and the impacts of invasives, uh, climate change, and the impact from humans and from cats and dogs. So we organized our draft actions under three themes. Restore, design, and engage. And we move to the next one. So, restore is really about protecting the, um, our species at risk. There's a number of them on this, this slide image here. One is the American eel, the chimney swifts, and then also encouraging our extirpated species to return. And these are the species that used to live here and they don't anymore. So how can we bring them back by enhancing the habitat that would be, uh, uh, that they would like? And an example of that is a karma uh, blue butterfly which you see on the lower left hand side. It's also about enhancing expanding habitat and that's really a big one because habitat is providing food, refuge, shelter and opportunities for reproduction. It's also about enhancing stopovers. We have a lot of migratory birds that come through Toronto for example. And then removing invasive species. And you'll be happy to know that in the newly adopted and in effect Toronto Green Standard, we do have a number of performance measures that deal with this. For instance, that you cannot plant invasives uh, through this process and you have to have 50% of native species are required. Go ahead. So under design, and if you think about design, if you think about the city as being part of nature, and how can we improve that thought and get that going? So we have best practices. We have under our draft actions the idea of best practices for biodiversity, the idea of eco passages. We have some in place now, and the idea of mowing practices. So you don't mow as you, in order to create habitat. We've already got some things underway. You're familiar with our. our very um, successful bird-friendly glass, which we uh, have glass treatments to avoid blur bird collisions. We have the uh, bird blind in East Point Park, and we have the uh, biodiversity for green roofs. Next. One of the most effective tools that we have is engaging the community, because through public advocacy is how we're really successful. So we can create more awareness of the um, impact of biodiversity we can really go far. 
So an example of this that we have in the um, draft booklet is from New York City where they have created oyster fields, recreated oyster fields, and that helps with resilience as well as bringing back a certain um, biodiversity into the city. Um, the idea of Safari 7 so that you would actually go with a, your, your um, iPod or whatever and you download an application or your phone and you would hear the story of the biodiversity along a particular route, a streetcar route, a bus route, a subway route in the city. Or the idea of collecting different pieces involving the community and collecting different pieces of what's important in a particular park and then putting it in an artistic display. And the idea on the upper left hand corner on this uh, slide is from um, the, uh, one of the uh, competitors winners in our winter stations project this year. So finally, our next steps are really, we're having, uh, in collaboration with the University of Toronto, which we're delighted about, we're having a fall workshop which will include lectures to the public, it'll include tours of biodiverse areas in the city, um, I think High Park is on one of the lists that we have, and, uh, and then we'll continue on and meet with stakeholders individually, we'll form an advisory group, and then we'll come back to this committee in 2019 with the final biodiversity strategy. Thank you very much. Any uh, questions? Uh, Councilor Matlow. Um, so thank you both for um, your innovative and critically important work on this biodiversity strategy draft. Yes. Um, with all the, the initiatives that you, that you cite in your, in your draft report, do you have the resources to implement all of your aspirations? And if not, what do you need to ask us for to be able to see this through to fruition successfully and within a reasonable time period? Uh, through the chair, that's an excellent question, and that'll be part of the work that we do in this next phase. To what does that mean? So, so what do you need to do then to undertake to in this next phase to determine sort of what, what those are? It'll be working with all our partners throughout the city um, and, and our external stakeholders to determine how much we can take on and how much we'll have to ask uh, for a budget for. What do you believe the state of our city's biodiversity is today with respect to, like if you were gonna, I mean, I don't, uh, sometimes it's sort of arbitrary to give it a grade, but uh, do you believe that we're, we're in a good place? Do you think that we are in an awful place? Do you feel like there's a lot of work to do? Where are we at? Uh, through the chair, I'll start to answer that question. Perhaps I'll call on my colleagues uh, from the Conservation Authority and Forestry to answer more, their more specific answers. Um, and I think we've, we've done some very good things in the city. You know, we have a, a ravine strategy to tackle that. We've got good, uh, solid policies in our official plan. Um, but there's, I think, more we could do. Uh, Karen, did you want to tackle that? Uh, thank you. Through the chair, Terry excuse me, has recently completed a, a, a report card for the watersheds within the city of Toronto. Biodiversity right now seems to be uh, holding steady. Uh, there's been no significant gain, um, but again, there's been no significant loss. I think a lot of that can be attributed to the ongoing funding that the city has provided for some initiatives, including a lot of habitat restoration, which is what we do. But steady at what? Like steady at a low place, steady at a medium place, steady at a really like something to boast about worldwide place. I believe it was assigned a grade of D. D, thank you. You're welcome. A steady D, okay. Thank you. Well, thank you, wow. No, thank you for your candor. Okay, Councillor um, Doucette. Thank you very much, Travis. This is great, and I appreciate the fact this is a draft and we're going out to consultation. So my question is this. We've set ourselves the proposed themes and actions, um, restore, design, and engage. Would you agree that if we added protect, um, that might mean we actually don't have to restore, because if we're protecting what we've got, we may get to a stage where it will sort of flow that way. So would you be okay with me adding protect as one of making it three items to make it four items we look at as themes while you go out to consultation? Uh, through the chair, I, I agree that would be a good addition to protect. But, 
perfect. I didn't describe I it very like well. I apologize. I'd like to keep the store in there because I Oh, no, keep it. No, I'm not saying get rid of it. I'm just saying that if we protect what we've got, we may not have to restore it. But it's good to have restore there just in case we find some areas now which need restoring because we haven't protected them. Right? <laughs> Thank you. That's it. <laughs> All right. Any other questions of staff? All right, we actually have deputants on this item, so we will, thank you very much staff, that was fantastic. We will um, just bring them up, and our first deputant is Paula Davies from the Toronto Field Naturalists. Hi Paula, have you been here before? Yes, I have. Okay, great. Um, I just want to clarify that I am a proud member of the Toronto Field Naturalists, but I'm speaking today on behalf of Protect Nature Teal. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. All right, um, Madam Chair, Councillors, staff, and colleagues. Um, we are speaking today on behalf of Protect Nature Teal, which is a coalition advocating for the protection of wildlife and natural areas across the city. We share the draft strategy's aim to increase the quality and quantity of natural habitat based on 19 actions that are in the plan. We also share the strategy's concerns that just came up with uh, Councillor Matlow, that nature faces many challenges here, including loss and fragmentation of habitat, invasive species, and so on. As highlighted in the Parks Plan 2013-2017, quote, natural environments have a threshold or tipping point for disruption beyond which severe and possibly irreversible damage is done to ecological health. Unfortunately, some of our natural areas are at this tipping point. I think the grade of D points that out pretty clearly. Here are a few of our specific recommendations to consider. First, we agree, please add protect as a theme to the themes restore, design, and engage. How can we protect things? Well, we have a number of places with high biodiversity value already, and they are our environmentally significant areas. We hope that you'll put more emphasis on preserving the ecological integrity of our environmentally significant areas and other high quality areas. The ESAs um, need management plans. Currently, only seven of the 86 ESAs now have a management plan. Many more need to be prepared. These plans will protect our rarer species within the ESAs, as well as remaining common species. We need to establish a protocol to find which activities are incompatible with the preservation protection of each ESA in accordance with the official plan policy 3.4.13. And this um, directive is also in the Parks Plan 2013 to 2017. In fact, as I researched some of this with my colleagues, we found that many of the things that I'm saying are already in the Parks Plan and in the Forestry Plan. It just needs to be brought together and then find ways of implementing things. Um, for the ESAs, ensure no city department undertakes work near an ESA without verifying the ESA and complying with the official plan. Too often, um, we are our own worst enemy. ESAs, um, for their management plans, need to consult st current stewards, experts, leaders, and community groups who've been working sometimes for years on certain sites when drawing up the management plans because they have special knowledge from the field about those sites. One thing we need to think about is outside the ESAs and identify existing habitat for species at risk, for example, chimney swifts, and maintain a database so we can ensure compliance with federal and provincial regulations. Other examples of um, species at risk outside ESAs would be milk snakes, poke milkweed, which is a plant, and eastern meadowlark.
In this next part, um, I want to talk about regular maintenance, maintenance for the long term, which is required. As a steward myself, I know that it's a constant battle in our urban area um, to deal with the invasive species and other challenges and still protect things. So we're recommending that stewardship, with, with stewardship, we want to expand the community stewardship program, which is very successful, and then develop a protocol that encourages participation. And secondly, a very important one here for stewardship is to explore and implement other models of stewardship, including some that do not depend on direct city funding. Fifth, protection of flora and fauna. Increase protection of natural areas through effective signage and public awareness campaigns based on good scientific data using a variety of media supported by meaningful enforcement. Many citizens do not realize that their activities are causing harm to natural areas and an educational outreach program could help to mitigate these problems. While some citizens unfortunately flagrantly abuse natural areas thinking of illegal dumping and this sort of thing. We hope that you'll maintain for flora and fauna connections and corridors for wildlife between natural areas, and that is something uh, designated in the draft strategy. Next, improve communication and coordination internally between city departments and agencies regarding natural areas protection. Sometimes our elected officials and staff are so busy and have so much work to do that it's hard to find ways to communicate. So that would be a very, a very good one to implement. Lastly, and importantly, please develop a robust planning process that recognizes the legal protections for natural heritage and ensures that existing policies to protect biodiversity are enforced. We hope these recommendations can be included in the draft strategy as it moves to public consultation. And we did supply a more detailed um, version, which is already on file. Thank you very much, Paula. That's great. Any questions of the deputant? Fabulous. That means everyone understood clearly. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and next up is Karen Yukich. I'm not sure if I said that. High Park Nature. How was that for butchering your name? You did very well. I, I, Very well butchering it or pronouncing it? No, no, no. It's saying it. I told, I told someone once to just think of Yukon. Okay. And then she introduced me as Karen Yukon. So. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. Ms. Yukon, you can okay. take it away. So um, I, I'm making this submission on behalf of High Park Nature, which includes the High Park Natural Environment Committee, the High Park Stewards, and the website highparknature.org. Uh, High Park is one of the most significant natural sites within the City of Toronto. In fact, it's a biodiversity hotspot for all of Ontario. While accommodating well over a million human visitors a year, the park still manages to support a rich variety of wildlife and diverse habitats, including a 4,500-year-old globally rare black oak savanna. The people of Toronto, including thousands of children and students at all levels, as well as visitors and tourists, all benefit from this remarkable biodiversity in the midst of our urban environment. <clears throat> we believe there is much to learn from the High Park experience when developing a biodiversity strategy for Toronto. High Park provides a positive model for what can be accomplished with a science-based management plan and a city-funded restoration crew working in combination with dedicated volunteer stewards over the last 20-some years. At the same time, it demonstrates the threats that are mentioned in the strategy, including high-impact recreational uses such as foraging, off-road cycling, and dog-related activity. So while much has been preserved and improved, much has also been degraded overused and misused, undermining the restoration efforts and putting this natural treasure in peril. And these threats are not unique to High Park. According to the uh, June 2012 report of existing and proposed environmentally significant areas in Toronto, all sites that were studied were adversely affected to varying degrees by human disturbance. 
One of our challenges at High Park has been to ensure that the protection mandated under the Provincial Policy Statement 2014 is actually applied. And that is to ensure that nearby developments have no negative impacts on the natural heritage, natural heritage features, and ecological function. This should be made a routine part of the planning process. Similarly, similarly, the strategy should ensure compliance with the official plan and all existing bylaws related to protection of natural heritage. And all relevant departments should be aware of the rules and ensure that they are followed. The draft biodiversity strategy contains many sound recommendations, but as already discussed, we believe it needs strengthening in the area of protection. Creating new habitat can be exciting and rewarding, but our richest biodiversity exists in the areas that are already designated as environmentally significant, which is the ESAs. Both new and existing habitats require a long-term commitment to protection, compliance, and respect. We hope that the adoption and implementation of a comprehensive biodiversity strategy will mean that High Park and many other natural areas throughout the city will benefit from community stewardship and adequately resourced staff to carry out restoration, education, and enforcement, and protect our natural heritage for generations to come. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's fantastic. Anyone with questions for the deputy? All right. Thank you very much for coming in. Thank you. Next up is Leslie Gooding. Gooding. Hi, Leslie. You're a seasoned uh, veteran here, so I think you know the... Uh, this yeah. is a pretty picture of High Park. Um, you can see the um, you, you can see the the variety of flowers. This is this is a uh, what's called the tablelands, and it's a pic picture I took in July last year. And there are a couple of butterflies, which uh, I've had the opportunity to show to Karen, and she assures me are most likely clouded sulfur. This is a, um, a lot of what bio when you start with the plants, they support. Uh, fauna all the way up, uh, all the way up the, the food chain up to the apex predators. Um, I mostly came to present, um, 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 you have heard the presentations from High Park Nature um, and from Protect Nature TO. Um, I mostly want to reiterate that uh, we appreciate that the strategy before us, which we're thrilled to see, is a draft and we'll go out for more, for broader consultation um, and are requesting um, protection be one of the themes in that. Um, you're, we, we have some very, very high quality uh, biodiverse nodes. Um, protecting those and expanding from those um, would be some, um, the basis of of in, uh, as well as well as the sites that are used by species at risk, which are human sites, those would be the basis of a biodiversity strategy that you would then expand out. So, protecting what you already have is uh, is a key starting point, um, and we believe that if that is in the draft strategy as a theme, when consultation goes out, then that. Um, means that people like us who would respond would also be giving our best advice on to how to protect instead of having to fight to make sure that protection is one of the things that, that is considered in the consultation process. Um, and that is one of the reasons that we have, have asked, have, have talked to staff and have asked our counselors to consider protect as a theme. Um, one of the other things that is part of our experience that, that also came up in Councillor Layton's original concern is to look at what we should do about examining existing policies. 
Um, some of our experience is that existing policies are very strong, um, but it's, the city is a very large place and making sure that everybody who needs to know understands what the policies are is a challenge for the city. So that is a, a biodiversity strategy would mean um, some consideration of what existing policies are, but, but also in particular how we can make sure that those existing policies are used to protect our existing biodiversity. Um, and we appreciate there's a consultation process. We very much hope to be involved working with the city to provide the advice that many of us have in, in working with the city on a biodiversity strategy. That's what I wanted to talk to you about. Thank you very much. We just want you to keep that picture up there all day. <laughs> Any questions of, uh, of, for Leslie? Seeing none, uh, thank you very much for coming in and for all the work you do. Um, and next up is Eric Davies. I didn't see him. Oh, he's hiding. Eric Davies from the Faculty of Forestry, uh, University of Toronto. This guy knows his biz. And if you ever want to go for a walk in a ravine, this is the guy to take you, because you'll never walk through a ravine again the same way. I've just been bragging about you and your walks in the ravines, but you'll take us through a walk today. Thanks. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you for the, the introduction and the opportunity to be here. <clears throat> um, so uh, here's a little outline. The main three points for today would be, and I kind of had that, uh, we presented at the Toronto Ravine Strategy, the recommendations are pretty much the same. One is to adopt ecological integrity as the main policy management and science framework. Second one is to link the Toronto Biodiversity Strategy with the Toronto Marine Strategy to ensure that they're coordinated and make sense. And then the other one is to utilize the expertise of the Faculty of Forestry, which um, I think, and I think my colleagues at the faculty feel it's, it's consistently overlooked, as it was in the Ravine Strategy. I mean, the majority of habitat in Toronto's trees and forests. We've been world leaders for 110 years, and we were absent from the round table. So, um, my quick thoughts on the, uh, the strategy draft is very good. Uh, it touches on all kinds of great points. They're all types of things that I think everyone would want to employ. It's just, it's not implementable because there's no scientific definitions of either ecological integrity or biodiversity um, or ecosystem services. So the simple solution is do what everyone else in the world is doing. Uh, adopt ecological integrity as a scientific framework. Um, we have a pilot project that we did on this. I think it was an attachment, and there really is no time to waste because the quality of the ravines, uh, as you noted, is, is at a D. Uh, is at probably a lot lower in, in some other areas. I'll draw your attention to this paper. It's just in press. So it'll be a useful paper to review. Uh, some really great authors on here from Australia, 150 cities, you'll see Toronto in the bottom right is not bold because it doesn't have a plan. I emailed the author uh, last night and she said, well, she was very happy to hear that there is a plan that works because although this paper says that Toronto is not one of the leaders globally, by her looking over this plan, she thought it's bit, you know very promising, but as she says in this email, you can read the ecological integrity really is what people are using and the study is what we need to do because it provides us with the evidence to improve, right? This is like adaptive management and evidence-based policy. So I would encourage you to look at that paper. There's all kinds of experts around the world who are actively doing this. Uh, there's a tremendous amount. This just out last week from George Monbiot, arguably one of the world's leading thought leaders. 
It's not like biodiversity is just slowly disappearing. It's rapidly vanishing from right in front of our eyes. You don't need science to see this, right? So what state are the ravines in? I mean, if you look at the TRCA watershed report card, at least the one I saw, it was only two pages. The one longer was from 2003, but I don't think they do anything other than forest cover in the, in the, in, in the actual terrestrial area. I know in the aquatic area they do more, but forest cover, if it's 50% Nora maple, it's, it's not good health. So again, city of Toronto, we plant mostly non-native trees. That's why the city the, in the urban area is mostly non-native trees. These, the first quote in that book says, where you find native species, you find biodiversity. Where you find biodiversity, you find health, right? So the problem with planting an entire city of non-native species surrounds the ravines, and then the ravines get completely invaded by Invasive species, this is a study we recently conducted. It's as an appendix to this thing. Um, and in a nutshell, ravines used to be high quality. In 1977, about 10% was Nora Maple. We found over 40% now. Just the conservative projections are about there. So that's what's happening. It's, a, it's a, you know, you look at the uh, municipal policy for tree cover. This is just the projections, you don't have to look at it, but if you do the math and forecast through, right now our city trees were planting roughly half non-native, most of the regeneration in the ravines is like this. That's what the future looks like, right? So we've got to decide if we want to be like this or if we want to turn the ship around and really improve the biodiversity of the Toronto ravines. Um, I would, uh, so ecological integrity, takes a long time to describe it. It's like human health. What is human health? You can't really say it in a minute, but these documents here that you can see is used the United Nations, the national level, the federal, provincial level, everybody uses this. And it's not just in there, it's the first priority of the Canada Parks Act. It's the first priority of the Ontario Provincial Parks and Conservation Reserve Act. If you look at the appendice in the document that is here, every one of these uses ecological integrity, right? So this document, it needs to, utilize, incorporate modern science. Just a quick overview, really, of what biodiversity and ecological integrity is. Very complex biodiversity is the things we see, typically. Plants and animals, they fit together into ecosystems that are extremely complex, right? Much more complex than human health, and these things provide ecosystem services, which is what we want. And now everyone is emphasizing everything needs to be resilient. We want resilient ecosystem services, right? We want to have resilient ravines so we don't flood, but if we do, we need resilient ecosystems, we need resilient biodiversity. If we don't have resilient biodiversity, we won't have resilient ecosystems or ecosystem services. Um, you can think about this later, the rivet hypothesis. You don't know which part, when your plane is traveling quick, that you can pull off it before it collapses, right? That's the state we're at right now. And this is the world we live in. Our ecosystems are going a million miles an hour, and I see our job like NASCAR, I see you guys up there in the top booth with the, the headsets on listening to people that are down in the trenches doing this work. And then when you have the information, you can make very tactical decisions about how to improve this stuff. But this is the pace it's at now. Um, document I thought was very good. I, I love the first quote there, right? It sums it up, where you have native species, you have biodiversity, where you have biodiversity, you have health. This is where it kind of breaks down. If you look at the definitions of biodiversity, that's not biodiversity, that's the wondrous, teeming, calamitously threatened variety of, like, you, you, can't, you can't implement that, right? You can't, how do you, how do you put that into play? Um, these are just quotes, they're not definitions. The definition of biodiversity is ecological integrity. Again, ecosystem functions, the description, that's not what ecosystem functions are. They're, you know, they're produced by all ecosystems and they're not just humans, they're everything that does. So, you know, some key updating on this document will really help to employ it. And again, there's the round table. If we had been there, we probably wouldn't have been able to save a year or two, I think, of progress on this. Uh, this can is fantastic. Can I get one final yeah. thought? It's been scintillating, so I've been so captivated. Okay, so, I haven't watched yeah, the time. <laughs> the, final t the final thought is to mm. uh, integrate modern science into this. I think, you know, re read those papers, get some experts on board that are, that are ecologists and evolutionary biologists, and. I think the future could be bright, um, and if not, I think we all know where, where, it'll, where it'll go. So thank you. Thank you very much, Eric. Any questions for Eric? Councillor Layton? Thank you very much. Uh, in your first couple slides, one in particular was the language around uh, how you'd like ecological integrity in 
incorporated in, and it just went by quickly, so I couldn't write it down. Okay, yeah. I think it was your like first or second slide. This one right here? As a policy, sorry, that first one. The first one right there? As a policy management and scientific framework. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Anything else for Eric? Okay, we have people to speak. So thank you very much, Eric. That was great. And I'm glad we have a copy of that. Thank you. Um, any questions of staff? <clears throat> Although we already kind of had them, but now we'll oh, have sorry, to. Sorry. Actually, we'll do more, but because after this, these deputants, you might have more. So um, how do we do the second round? Yeah. When it comes to the trees we're planting across our city, am I correct that we have, over the last few years, looked at what types of trees we're planting? that we really are going to the native tree now because we understand, and I, heck, someone's, someone around these rooms has taught me that the native trees benefit us more than the, the weed trees which sometimes were planted. Uh, through the chair, that is correct. For the past 30, uh, 32 years, we've been doing that actively. In fact, Toronto's been uh, influential in, in uh, in uh, getting the growing industry to recognize the need for more native trees and to recognize the methods for uh, uh, property sourcing genetic, uh, genetically native material and so on. Um, we've also had things, policies in place for nearly 30 years now uh, not to plant any invasive species on streets that are near or adjacent to ravines and larger park and open spaces. Um, so yes, uh, we, we're actively doing that and promoting native tree planting. And my understanding is in some of our parks, we are actually removing some of the um, non-native trees to even though they might be quite large, because it, in the years to come, it's more beneficial to replant with native. Is that correct? Uh, through the chair again, yes, that is correct. Uh, we we will sometimes remove uh, non-native invasive species mm -hmm. um, that are providing a seed source and progeny for new trees that are out-competing uh, high-quality natives. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, councillors to speak. Councillor Jamari. Oh, sorry. Sure. Just, just very quickly uh, mm. to, to staff around this, the notion of integrating ecological integrity as a principle into the plan. Do we have a position on that? Is there a reason why we shouldn't, or is it already, or at a, just as a response to the lap, last presentation? Sure, through the chair, I think that's a reasonable request to consider ecological integrity. That is a great answer. Thank you very much. Um, so just to follow up on that, I thought I moved that at one point in time. I'm pretty sure we, uh, at one, no? Okay. <laughs> I remember, I, this is like deja vu, right, Eric? Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll move it again. If, uh, thank you. Um, all right, uh, Council to speak, Council Arjumari. Thank you. I'm very happy to move this report. Uh, I think that it's undeniable that, uh, well, to most people, that uh, uh, biodiversity is crucial to the livability of our city, of any city, and for the fight against uh, environmental degradation. More than ever, we should be paying attention to what's happening out there at TRCA. That's uh, our job and our aim. What pleased me most about the draft of the strategy is that uh, planning will be working together with uh, environment. And just think of what we could have in future, and hopefully as, as quickly as next year. A planning, a planning regime where biodiversity plays a part in a redevelopment and a sizable redevelopment application where biodiversity uh, takes precedence over some of the things that we now uh, in a 19th century and 20th century mode of thinking think that um, is integral to the planning process. We really have to change to a 21st century model which is a survival model. Um, I'm gonna have a thousand acres in Downsview to, to redevelop over the next 
uh, few years. Can you imagine if we could uh, daylight some streams and rivers in that plan? If we could make a milkweed garden so that we can have a resurgence of the monarch? Uh, not your monarch, the monarch butterflies. <laughs> um, I'll take the butterflies any day. Okay. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> it's it's quite exciting, and I and I understand that a couple of members will be coming forward with uh, amendments, and I'm supporting them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Ashmary. Anyone else, uh, Councillor Wong Tao? Uh, yes, thank you very much. I'll just keep my remarks extremely brief. Um, I think this is an excellent, excellent initiative, and I want to thank Councillor uh, Layton for um, for I guess leading the charge. It's largely his motion from 2000. And 15 or 13 or something that started off, um, but still it's st still a very good, very good start. Um, I think the um, the deputants were, were very rich in, in, in their in their content, and and there were there were points in, in time where it actually made me pivot, saying, "Have we gone as far as we need to go?" Even though it's only a draft, um, and and I think certainly there is still room for improvement. My biggest concern about strategies like this, and even the pending ravine strategy that Councillor Matlow and I've been working on, uh, with the support of this committee. Um, or perhaps even transform TO or perhaps the anti-poverty strategy and so forth and so forth is we put together these fantastic vision documents that don't get operationalized implemented and I think that's where we need to uh, number one uh, make sure that our colleagues um, including the mayor at City Council uh, will not just speak to it but rather really commit to it and make sure that it gets done and just as Councillor uh, Ajamari has stated like really we are looking at the survival of, uh, of, of, of us on the planet. Um, and this is just a small little uh, pin, if we were to put the pin into the map of, of our, us doing our very, uh, our very share. And uh, especially in light of the fact that the province is, seems to be walking backwards in time on a lot of these climate change and, and, uh, and preservation strategies in the natural environment, cities have got to do more. And that means that we're gonna have to fund it, we're gonna have to empower the divisions to get the work done, um, and we're going to have to monitor to make sure that it is uh, that we are meeting uh, benchmarks. And so they're not just uh, they're not just lofty themes, but they're actually operational pieces. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Wong Tam. Um, Councillor Doucette. Thank you very much. So I have a motion, and the motion is that we do include protect biodiversity as a first action and restore, design, and engage as the other key actions, including a review of the existing policies for effectiveness in protecting biodiversity. So yes, thank you for, to the deputants. Thank you for reaching out to us before this meeting as well. I know you guys read these reports as soon as they're hot off the press or they're live. We don't always get to read them as quickly as you do, so I really appreciate feedback coming to our offices. And yes, staff do support this, so I think this is a great idea. As I, in my weird, wonderful way, I was trying to say that if we can protect what we've got, we won't have to restore all of that area. Some I know we do because humans use our parks. We'll never stop humans using our parks, but it's a balancing act, Hyde Park particularly. We balance maybe 30 different groups wanting to use the parks, whether it is sports activities, whether it's walks, whether it's um, protecting the, the ESAs, whether it's running your dog off-leash, either in the off-leash area or outside the off-leash area. People have a right to use our parks, but I see it that as a city and as residents who are so engaged with these areas, it's also our responsibility to, to protect what we've got. If we left Hyde Park just to get on with itself, we wouldn't have a Black Oak Savannah right now. So one of the motions, which I know the res you, um, visitors didn't get to see, but was moved really, really quickly at the beginning of this meeting, is I am requesting that um, we do a complete review of the Hyde Park Woodland and Savannah Management Plan and the staff come back with a recommendation. But this is what we heard during our Bloor West Avenue study. It's what we heard during our High Park Apartment Neighborhood Character Study, that we need more in-depth review of how our management plan is working in High Park. So that is one that did pass earlier 
very quickly it did go through. So that's another thing we can do in our area. I know staff are doing everything they can. This report as a draft is great. I look forward to hearing the consultation. Everyone come and get engaged with the consultation. That's what we need to hear, what is out there, what suggestions, and that's how we have a good policy to work with. And I am 100% sure that staff are gonna connect it to our ravine strategy because it all makes sense. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Qu uh, Councilor Doucette. Any questions of the mover of the motion? No, I see none. To speak over here, Councilor Matlow, I think was next, Councilor Layton. I want to, uh, I want to begin by thanking staff for uh, their presentation and for the work that they're doing. And I want to, I want to acknowledge, um, uh, you know, there, there are people who are often um, unsung, but I think deserve some recognition. And one of, uh, one of them, although I know there are many others, uh, is uh, Kelly Snow, uh, who, uh, you know, many years ago helped initiate this strategy with ideas and and passion and. Uh, you know, sometimes we don't know what seed was planted to grow something that's part of our strategy, uh, but I know that Kelly uh, was critical in, in helping plant this, and I, I respect him and I appreciate him, as I do his colleagues. Um, this is, you know, often when we talk about a, diver a biodiversity strategy and protecting our natural environment, it becomes a conflict in our city between uh, the word progress, which is often a misnomer, uh, and, um, and protecting the, the, the green space or watersheds or wildlife habitats uh, that we have. Um, we see that happening on the green belt north of our city where there's a you know, constant friction between um, the need for housing, the need for development and progress, and then the need to protect aquifers and green space, and et cetera. But the more that we talk about this between us and them, we lose sight of the fact that protecting biodiversity and, uh, and improving uh, uh, and restoring uh, areas that need it uh, is all about us. It's all about us. It is completely self-serving in the most wonderful ways. It's not about making the place better for bees. It's about the bees making the place better for us and everyone who shares this planet. Uh, and if the bees benefit from it, wonderful too, because they are fellow earthlings. But we don't sacrifice anything by protecting our natural environment. We only improve our ability to, as my colleague said, um, support our survival in the long term. But we also can't forget about the short term. Um, improving our natural environment contributes to our well-being. It, contributes to our physical health, it contributes to our mental health. Um, it creates and protects spaces where we can get away from the intensity of the big city and find refuge uh, in, in peace. Um, it's critically important. So I love and I appreciate the fact that both this political leadership here and there's staff leadership working on a strategy that will recognize that we live within something bigger than just concrete and steel and glass, but that actually all of that started being built atop uh, an environment that we continue to live in and we often forget. So um, I'm definitely supporting moving forward with the next phase, but I'm gonna re remind staff of this and. Um, and as Councillor Wong Tam said very well, we have a lot of aspirational documents sitting around this place. Uh, lots, lots of big announcements, big ribbon cuttings, uh, big press conferences, and then we just don't budget it or we run off to other priorities. Um, and I don't want that to happen to this. Um, and I, I guess my message to, to staff is, um, you know, as I mentioned to Kelly uh, recently, uh, you know, when, when, when my mom was around, she, uh, she used to leave little gifts at people's homes that we'd visit. And I asked her why she did that, and she said, well, you should always leave a place better than you found it. And you have that opportunity to leave a legacy, an amazing legacy to our city and to our kids. And I just ask you to have the courage to ask for what you need to succeed. Don't fear. 
uh, ever asking for the resources, the budget, the tools you need to be able to see this project through to fruition. Um, speak up if you don't receive that support because we have a responsibility to uh, support the good work that we agree on when we vote for these things. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Matlow. Councillor Layton. Yes, thank you very much. I have a motion that the Parks and Environment Committee requ request the Chief Planner and Executive Director of City Planning to integrate ecological integrity as a policy management and scientific framework for the final recommended biodiversity strategy. Um, we heard that just on the motion that that was a reasonable request to make. I think I'm asking the right person. I first had Jim in there, but I, I was advised by the clerk to change it. Uh, so I, I did. Um, so I, I, I live just opposite Christie Pitts, and, and most nights in the summer, my wife and I will be out hanging out in the backyard or walking down the street, and there would always be these little birds darting around um, a large chimney in, in close to our house. And uh, we knew, my wife's a birder. She knew what they were. They were chimney swifts. We were, we were, we're pleased to have them. We also have nighthawks that live in the neighborhood. Um, and we listen to those as uh, as the sun goes down, and it's quite a beautiful soundtrack to our uh, uh, to to our summer evenings. Um, then we got notice that the building was going to be demolished, and that wasn't in and of itself a problem, uh, but they were going to demolish it right in like the the center of roosting season. That has since been delayed several times now for other reasons, but we got really worried about that. And my partner asked me, well, it's, it's, in, it's species habitat. Don't worry, it would be protected. No, it wouldn't, uh, because the development applications to, to demolish a building don't have a box to say, is there endangered species habitat? They don't go to the, uh, the MNR or to uh, any other divisions to confirm that 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 building doesn't in fact uh, have an endangered species habitat uh, uh, that is is associated with the building. The trees around it don't have that 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 same protection. Uh, so um, this is where uh, the notion of of the mo of of the letter that I first submitted um, in 2015 came from was that we need to have a strategy there to to catch. It was a very simple catch. It's very simple. It's just don't demolish that chimney during roosting season. Demolish it at any other time. You're destroying habitat, but at least you're not destroying habitat where, 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 where fledglings, if, if that's what they're called, um, are, are, are roosting. Like there, there, there's an importance of the timing there that we could very well accommodate within our, our process, but it wasn't being accommodated. Um, then I had a conversation with a, an old friend of mine, uh, Leslie Adams of Power, and some of you may know, uh, know her. There. She's out of Halton region, does a lot of biodiversity work along the Niagara Escarpment. And she came and said, you know, other cities around the world are doing this to uphold the international uh, uh, convention or, or whatever the terminology is on, on, on biodiversity. And, and Toronto really should get on it as, a, as, as Canada's largest city. And she gave me a, a, a pile of documentation. I'll, I'll admit now I read very little of it. Uh, but I was sold on the idea that, uh, that integrating with some of our other policy uh, priorities, uh, biodiversity should be one of them. I, I like the notion of taking it one step further and looking at ecological integrity. I think that that, that really is at the, the core goal of it. For me, it's not just looking at at, at, at pretty species, it's 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 also how they all function together. Um, so I'm I'm quite happy to put that motion forward. I think that's a very good recommendation. Um, but but finally, it's it's really exciting to see a project like this uh, sort of continue to move through. Often we make motions as as city councilors, knowing nothing ever is ever going to come back. And and staff, we love you, but sometimes we do write motions that we know uh, won't see the light of day. Uh, but I think that this is uh, like this sets sets us down a path um, into the next term that will have a good, strong policy uh, come out at the end. And then, as Councillor Matlow said, we're just going to have to find a way uh, to ensure that uh, any funding requirements are being met uh, so that we can achieve this. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Any questions of the mover and the motion? No, seeing none. All right. Um, and I just want to thank staff for the phenomenal work, looking very excited about the next steps, and thank our deputants who are diehard, um, um, what's my word, biodiversitists, 
Uh, but champions for our green space and, and for biodiversity, and you educate us regularly, and you never give up, and I just am so thankful for all the work you do, and um, just know we really appreciate it, and we learn from you every day. Um, so with that, we, do we want to take everything as a package? All in favor? Oh, that carries. Thank you very much. And, it, and we'll just adopt the item as amended. All in favor, opposed, that carries. Um, our uh, exceptional and um, competent clerk has just let me know that we, uh, I'm gonna pass a motion to extend uh, through the agenda through lunchtime, just to, uh, just to finish the agenda. Is everyone in favor of that? All in favor, opposed, that carries. Thank you. Um, all right, and next up we have the last deputant is for PE 29.6, wireless connectivity on Toronto Island Park, and that is Allison Rogers. Is Allison here? Thank you for waiting, Allison. It's interesting, eh? <laughs> we did that for you. Community Association and wearing my hat of emergency services liaison so it means I talk to the police and the fire department and the and the uh, paramedic services I organized a community safety meeting a couple of months ago now and in that meeting this issue was raised uh, of the the lack of cell coverage on the island and, and the danger that poses because it means that 911 services are not available to people on the island. At that meeting, we had representatives from 52 Division, from the Marine Unit, of, from the police, um, from the fire, from our local fire station, and from the. Sorry, there's just a, a bit of a din in the room. I can't hear you, so that's great. Thanks. So we had, we had representatives from all of our emergency services and they were, they were sh surprised and, and very concerned about the fact that large swaths of the island are un, you know, don't have access to 911 and couldn't call in case of an emergency. So I wanted to come here today and just tell you a story. I had a, you know, probably because it was on my mind, but uh, I, had, I had an interesting day last Sunday. I got off the ferry and I saw there's three or four people and they're wandering around the ferry docks with their cell phones in their hands, searching for a, for, for a signal. Now, it's not unheard of, but there was a number of them. I just thought, imagine if we had a Wi-Fi hotspot at the ferry docks. People could look up ferry times and you know maps or directions around the island, information about the flora and fauna and the history and geography of the island. I think it would really improve the, the experience of visitors to the island. So I walked a little further down the road. I live on Algonquin, so I have a little further walk to go to get home. And I saw a neighbor of mine, and she's out on the main road on the island in her uh, bathrobe and slippers. And she's on her phone. Hello, hello. Can you hear me? How about now? And she's walking up and down the road. And, and I thought, you know, imagine if she could sit in the privacy of her own living room and have a conversation with her friend. So I continued on my way and I got to Algonquin Island Bridge and standing at the top of the bridge is a young man who I've known his whole life. And of course, you guessed it, you know, he has his cell phone in his hand and he's waiting for a phone call from a potential employer. And he, so he's got this telephone in interview set up and the only place that he could be you know, relatively assured of a solid phone signal to conduct that interview was standing in the heat at the top of Algonquin Island Bridge. And I thought, you know, what if our, wouldn't it be great if our communications infrastructure was reliable enough to support a young person's job search? You know, our commercial enterprises require that kind, those, those services. You know, you, nobody carries cash anymore. They have to be able to accept credit and debit. And you can't do that without reliable service. 
Later that same day, I took my daughter down to the beach and we we're supposed to meet up with my sister and the beach was packed. It's been pretty hot lately in Toronto, so we weren't able to get a, a spot for our towel where we thought we were gonna be able to meet my sister, so I sent a text to my sister telling her where she could find us. And a few minutes later, a, a familiar little symbol showed up next to my message. And my message had failed to send. Reception on Ward's Beach is not great at the best of times, but with all those people trying to access the network, my little five word text could not get out. So I sighed in frustration and I took my two year old daughter's hand and we walked 10 minutes before we could get that text message to send. Believe me, her protests were not sighs. <laughs> so we walked back to the beach after getting the message sent and we looking forward to cooling off in the water and my daughter, she's just learning to swim. She's a little bit overconfident. She likes to dive under the water. And she had a little sputter, a moment of, you know, a little water going down the wrong tube. No big deal. But I th it kind of struck me at that moment that if it had been more serious, we wouldn't have had access to 911. No, it, neither would anybody else on the beach. And that's a really big concern. There are many other places on the island where cell coverage is so poor or non-existent that people couldn't call if they were in distress. Most of the length of the boardwalk has such poor coverage that you, know, you, can't, you can't sustain a conversation. I have on more than one occasion run to the fire station to try to get help for people who've been hurt on the, on the boardwalk. They tend to drive their bikes off the edge. I don't run as fast as I used to, but I do carry a cell phone, you know, in case of emergency. Just one final thought, Allison. Oh, sorry. I didn't know about the time limit. <laughs> <laughs> the island school also sits in a dead zone. That's really, that's really scary. I want to say that islanders are aware of the scientific evidence that maybe there's some harm in, in all these wireless signals, but I think there's a, there's a much more immediate harm when people don't have access to 911 services. And there's an awful lot of visitors coming to the island every day. And I think it's unconscionable that we don't provide that service. Thank you. Any questions of the deputant? Seeing none, thank you. Thank you. Um, any questions of staff? Um, so, M motion, um, Councillor Wong Tam to speak. Thank you very much, and I believe Councillor Matlow is just uh, getting ready to move that motion. Thank you. Um, I want to thank um, Allison for coming and, and sitting through the presentations uh, and the deputations today. Um, I, I'm actually here on behalf of Councillor Troisi and I. We've been um, uh, having joint meetings now with uh, residents of the Toronto Island and getting to, and for myself in particular, getting to know some of the local issues that the community is, is most concerned about. Um, this is an issue that came uh, to my attention largely by just having conversations and trying to make arrangements to meet people across the island and realizing that, oh, it's actually not so straightforward. So, and that's o occasional when I, I need to go across as opposed to levy, having someone who actually resides on the island or operating a business on the island. And I think that Allison entirely hit the, uh, uh, the, the, the point uh, when, it talk, when she talked about the life safety and the systems around telecommunications and how we re are so reliant and we don't even probably know that we've become this reliant on telecommunications um, and the fact that most of us have probably given up our landline um, and are now using only mobile service and, and Wi-Fi. And, um, and it's actually quite alarming to me to, to, to comprehend that the thousands of people that board those ferries every single day are uh, have access to spotty service. And it was actually equally alarming that we're actually renovating the entire ferry um, and, uh, and, uh, and we're gonna try to do the, I think there's gonna be some plans to do some improvements on the other side of the island and, uh, and that this is not part of the overall strategy. So I know that uh, Councillor Troisi is very keen, um, as I'm, am I, to make sure that, uh, that we don't <coughs> delay too much um, with the staff report back, um, that we try to accelerate this work, largely with the lens that this is specifically around safety and life, um, uh, life uh, support systems. And uh, we actually uh, take a look at even the UN 
uh, declarations of rights, uh, this is a, a, a now a basic right, a, 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 a right uh, around internet access. Um, and so I want to thank um, uh, the staff in advance to, to accelerate the work. Um, and, uh, and thank you very much for meeting with us and working with us on the motion uh, to make sure that it gets the priority uh, attention that it deserves. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Wong Tam. Councillor Matlow. So, <clears throat> I'm happy to uh, move the recommendations uh, on uh, Councillor uh, Troisi and Councillor Wong Tam's behalf as well. Uh, and uh, just, I just want to acknowledge um, the good work that Councillor Wong Tam has done. Uh, in reflecting uh, an important priority to the residents of the island, uh, the students who go to the school, uh, and to ensure that they have um, you know, just reasonable access like the rest of the city does. I mean, they're, they're a part of our city, yet they're, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of absurd in a way that uh, they don't have that just reasonable access to uh, wireless in the way that other people do. Uh, when, when, when there are times, whether it be an emergency uh, or waiting for a job opportunity or you know, real life moments where, you know, whether we like it or not, our society does rely on these devices. And uh, so I, I just wanted to, um, you know, on their behalf, support uh, what they've asked for. And again, kudos to Councillor Long Tam for, um, you know, representing uh, the uh, a priority to those residents as well as she has. All right, all in favor? Or did you want to speak, Councillor Layton? Or all in favor? Yeah. There's a vote. Opposed? That carries. Thank you very much. So, yes, we, they do in, um, in uh, Greektown on top of a building. Um, so we're going to go back to PE 29.3, Sustainable Energy Plan Financing Program Enhancement. We don't have deputants on that, but I think we really want to speak to that. Um, so first of all, questions of staff. Councillor I'll just very quickly ask, uh, given the recent uh, decisions of the provincial government, how does that impact our sustainable energy portfolio of policies? Thank you, the Chair. Um, are you talking specifically about the 10 projects that we receive funding or more generally? Uh, both generally and specific to those 10 projects. The, the 10 projects, um, Basically, we had $52 million worth of provincial support, which has now been removed. Um, and uh, we've talked to the, the project managers across the organization that are impacted by this, um, including the TTC, um, who have planned to purchase electric buses. They will continue to do that, so unaffected. Um, we've talked to Solid Waste, who are doing a, a biogas, um, renewable natural gas facility. They will continue to do that. Um, we had four low carbon thermal network projects. Um, we have, um, a, fun, we have a, a, a business partner in N-Wave, um, and our, our, the, the N-Wave will continue to provide support for that, and they'll, they'll assume a larger financial role in this. They'll continue to go forward. Um, we have a project at um, St. Lawrence Market North. We have a project at a child care center in Mount Dennis. Um, a project at, uh, at uh, an EMS facility on Dufferin, they will continue to be funded through recoverable debt. So the 10 projects specifically, we have alternative arrangements for them at the moment. Um, more generally, when you look at Transform TO, um, again, it's, it's a relatively, I mean, I, I guess you have to take the silver lining. And the silver lining is that for most of the initiatives, we have alternative financing mechanisms. So home energy loan programs, local improvement charges, district energy, and wave. Um, the, the city is going to, uh, in the next month or so, be floating a th roughly $300 million green bond. So there are other mechanisms at play here, and we believe that um, we're, we're intact. I mean, if you think back to July of last year when we took transformed TO through uh, council for support. Um, at that time, you know, we knew the province was collecting cap and trade dollars, but there was no information about how it was going to be distributed. These initiatives, these projects were identified at that time and they've made business sense at that time. Um, and, you know, our approach within EED at this point is to go forward undaunted. Um, it would be a lot easier um, if the province was with us and behind us, but they're not. So we need to augment our leadership role 
um, in this space and move forward. So it's not ideal, but we're still going to make it happen. Absolutely. Our instructions from Council were to deliver Transform TO. It was not contingent upon support of the province. Thank you. I'd just like an opportunity to speak. Okay, so just to follow up on that, um, so it's a good thing we have contingency plans for for these projects, is what you're saying. Like it's, we do have a contingency plan, and, and thankfully you were, staff was prepared uh, with that backup plan. Actually, Councillor, if I may, I think it's the other way around. I think that these projects had business cases that yeah. that, that worked prior to there being provincial funding support. So we're basically going back to plan A. Right, and, but overall, I mean, this kind of, I guess, thinking and attitude and, and I mean, how does that bode well for, for our, um, all of our green projects at the city and Transform TO, in your mind? I think, Actually, as I said a minute ago, I think that we have the impetus to move forward. We have the mechanisms to finance these things outside of provincial support. Um, it would be, our job would be a lot easier, it would be a lot simpler if the province was lined up with us, and they were, um, but they're not now. And I think this is a really great opportunity for the city to continue to demonstrate leadership in this space. Thank you. All right, to speak is Councilor Layton. Thank you very much. Um, I have a motion that City Council express its deep concern with the provincial cuts to programs that reduce greenhouse gases and the withdrawal from national, regional, and international agreements to reduce greenhouse gases. Um, well, uh, I, I'm very pleased to hear that we will continue with uh, these, uh, with Transform TO and, and the projects. Um, it, it's very distressing what's going on at the provincial level. Um, the climate change as an issue has seemed to not only have uh, dropped off the radar of stuff that the province will be actively pursuing, but in fact there seems to be an assault on the very notion mm -hmm. that we should be doing stuff to fight climate change. And that is extremely alarming um, given uh, what is happening uh, internationally and even locally uh, with our climate. Uh, I think at every opportunity we need to express to the provincial government that the residents of Toronto, that Toronto City, the corporation of the city of, of Toronto wants to live up to our international obligations and to future generations by taking action now to fight climate change. And I just wanted to use this opportunity to highlight it. We tried twice at council last, uh, uh, last month and we will continue to use every opportunity to, uh, to fight this government on these dangerous moves. Thank you very much, Councillor Layton, Councillor Ajamari. I'm not clear on the differentiation between the former ministries and the present ministry uh, competencies. And I would like uh, informally to ask staff if they could look into that. For example, <coughs> I understand that uh, conservation authorities will no longer be uh, overseen by the Minister of Natural Resources, that it could be overseen by uh, Minister Phillips' uh, ministry. And I understand that more changes are underway, um, and they're working on them now. I don't know how this will affect our forestry division. Uh, is it division or department? Well, is forestry a division? Okay, our forestry oh, branch. I don't know how it uh, how it will yeah. affect um, <laughs> our cons our relationship with the conservation authorities. So um, maybe staff could informally and over the summer and into the fall look into that. I understand that new deputy ministers are now being contemplated, and and with those announcements, there will be concomitant announcements about um, what the new tasks will be for each of those ministries that I already mentioned. So I just wanted to flag that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Councilor Jamari. Anyone else to speak? I just wanted to um, commend Councilor Layton on that motion. It, it is absolutely the right thing to do. And I'm 
Very relieved to hear we have our uh, business cases and our uh, green bond and, and whatnot to finance these programs because I had a, a coronary yesterday when I found out the devastating and preposterous news that uh, the funding is cut. It, as we know, being uh, sustainable is actually good for the bottom line, not just you know the environment, not just ribbon cuttings, not um, just healthy living, but it, it is uh, financially beneficial too. And I'm just going to read you these 10 projects that thankfully um, seem to be able to go ahead. But I mean, they they don't, they're not, you know, about the downtown latte sipinalitis as that rhetoric is. It, these are all over our city. Um, so the Etobicoke Civic Precinct Low Carbon Thermal, Thermal Energy Network, the Dufferin Organics Processing Facility Biogas Upgrade, Toronto's Green Fleet Program, Mount Dennis Net Zero Early Ch Learning and Child Care Centre, Young and Eglinton Low Carbon Thermal Energy Network, Tr TTC, uh, Battery uh, Electric Buses, St. Lawrence Market North, Gas Exchange System, Scarborough Village Low Carbon Thermal Energy Network, um, Toronto Emergency Medical Services, Building Retrofit, and Liberty Village Low Carbon Thermal Energy Network. I mean, it's, it affects our whole city and all of our residents. So I'm glad we have the contingency plan, but I, I do not think that this bodes well for, for future, um, and I'm, I'm very concerned. So happy to support this motion and send, send a clear message to the province. Madam Chair, uh, could I ask you a question? Sure. Uh, the ones that you just read out mm -hmm. are the ones that are in peril? or the ones that have well, lost no, funding? No, we've just been told they're not because there were business cases for them, but they, the, we were working with the province with that funding, but you could probably take it offline and ask um, Jim. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so with that, uh, all in favor of Councillor Layton's motion? Opposed? That carries. And the item as amended, opposed, that carries. Now we just, do we do have an award, if you want to sit tight, for? Just going to read it to you. We have a great award. Um, if you recall this book, the, uh, which I think all of us have seen or you've read, Enduring Wilderness, uh, we have an award recognition. The, so the book on an Enduring Wilderness, Toronto's Natural Parklands, commissioned by the city, has received a 2018 Award of Merit for Planning Excellence from the Canadian Institute of Planning. This Award of Merit honors projects deemed as exemplary resources to the planning profession. An Enduring Wilderness is a collection of landscape photographs from different geographical areas of the city by visual artist Robert Burley, who I believe is here. Is, uh, was he? He was here earlier, oh, but he had to leave, oh, unfortunately. Uh, so together with short essays by established Canadian writers and supporting historical natural history History material, the book is a collaboration between artists and poets and city planning and parks, rec and forestry. It celebrates Toronto's parkland system, shows the parklands as they exist today and how they appear at various times throughout the year. And um, the jury highlights why the project was selected for the award of merit. Overall, the project was visually beautiful and very creative. It was highly effective in achieving its goal of creating a connection between the reader and the natural elements within the city and relating that to the question of future livability. Um, and Enduring Wilderness was published in May 2017 by ECW Press and attending to receive the acknowledgement was Robert Burley, uh, Jane Weniger, Senior Planner, City uh, Planning and key staff who should be recognized, Garth Armour who's recently retired, Jane Welsh right over there, my constituent, Richard Ovens right there, Director um, and Wayne Reeves, Chief Curator. Is Wayne here? Oh, it's too bad. So I don't know if, um, and if we want, do you want to photograph uh, anyone or you just want a round of applause? I don't know.
May I, may I uh, just, just briefly say, given that this is the final uh, committee meeting of the term, that along with acknowledging the terrific work that staff has done to support the work of this committee, I want to acknowledge uh, the Chair, Mary Margaret McMahon, for the work that she's done to chair this committee and to provide leadership to the environmental file at the City of Toronto and all of the members who I've worked with here on a really respectful uh, and productive committee. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Can I, uh, can I just... It's very unusual for us to have a, 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 qu a quick mention, but I'd just like to express our thanks as well to uh, Chair Councillor Mary Margaret McMahon on the extensive relationship, and we have brought a very native, a very oh. native <laughs> celebration uh, of, of the leadership for the committee for the last few years. Uh, that's lovely. On behalf of all of us. Oh, oh my God, look at this. <laughs> Thank you. team because uh, I would just like to say you guys well I need to give you my resume because you're so the staff here are so great Janie Jim Richard oh, Jason uh, Matt Julie, oh, come on. Everyone. Yeah, Sarah. it's been a pleasure I'll see you on the outside can we can we say something too we would also with an environment and energy like to oh. express our thanks to you um, it's only been in the last two years that you've been chair here but it's been a wonderful two years and we've done an incredible amount of work that's been really good for the city um, and just to, we have a small token of our appreciation that we managed to collect this morning while the good people of uh, Ward 32 were sound asleep um, but uh, thank you very much <laughs> May, Marcus, Scott.